Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, the True Crypt project has shut down and we'll run down the most likely answer to this sudden mystery. Then is the good news for the OpenSSL project, the top 10 misconfiguration mistakes for Windows, and then a great big batch of your questions and our answers. All that and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 164 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on May 29th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, Ting, DigitalOcean, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. And of course, I should also mention that our live stream is provided by the excellent folks over at Scale Engine, which Alan yes. knows a few things about. So go over to scaleengine.com and check that out. Alan, huge show this week. Huge show. Yesterday, yep. as I was getting unfiltered sort of prepared, uh, the whole internet blew up about TrueCrypt. Like, TrueCrypt is like, I mean, in the last 24 hours, I feel like my whole world has gone upside down because I don't know, maybe I was mistakenly one of those people that was like a TrueCrypt believer. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so I guess to start, uh, TrueCrypt, uh, their website now announced that the project is being shut down and that you should stop using it. Yeah. Uh, and for people that don't know, TrueCrypt is like a cross-platform encryption system that can do both like images, like just here's an encrypted file that lives on my hard drive full of encrypted files, like a volume, uh, or whole disk encryption. So you encrypt your operating system disk or even like, you know a USB stick or whatever. Uh, one of the advantages was... Um, it was available for Windows, Mac, Linux, BSD, et cetera. So it meant that, you know, if you encrypted a USB stick on Windows and took it to another machine, like a Linux machine, you could still plug it in and access the files. Uh, right? Where most, you know, most operating systems now have some type of encryption system, but none of them are compatible between each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so the website for TrueCrypt was changed yesterday to state that TrueCrypt may contain unfixed security issues and you should stop using it. Not just uh -huh. changed, but redirected to a uh, SourceForge well, page. Right. They shut down their hosting yeah. and, and moved the domain to SourceForge, which they already had a page at SourceForge. They just updated it and did the redirect right. instead. Um, uh, the page also states that now that Windows XP is end of life, this is kind of why they're doing it. Uh, all supported versions of Windows, which is you know Vista and up, uh, now come with BitLocker, and so... There's no reason for so people that still depend on TrueCrypt. Whereas when XP was still alive, you know that was TrueCrypt was basically your only option on Windows XP. Uh, the website also provides information and set of screenshots and showing you how to uh, convert your data, how to you know take your stuff off TrueCrypt and put it onto BitLocker. Um, and it also released the new version 7.2 of TrueCrypt, which only allows users to decrypt their files, not encrypt any new files. Uh, so you can only use it to get your data out of your TrueCrypt volume, not uh, to, you can't keep using TrueCrypt with the new version. Uh, originally, people obviously thought this was a hack of the website, uh, partly just because of how bare bones the website is. It was, you know, put together very quickly. Uh, and, you know, they figured they're just, the website got compromised and somebody wrote this up or whatever. And so they were very suspect, uh, suspect of the new version of the software on the website, right? It's like, don't download that. It's probably a Trojan or something, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, however, once people started looking into it, uh, the, the new 7.2 binary is signed with the same private key that 7.1 and so on was signed with. Oh, I thought it was uh, signed so with the key that was generated after 7.1. No, uh, it's the same key they've been using okay. for at least the last two years. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, there was something with a key on SourceForge. Something happened, and, and uh, but it got reverted, so okay. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so the new binary is signed with the same key as the old ones, suggesting that it was published by the same people. Uh, also, a bunch of other little, you know, uh, in, inconspicuous bits uh, are the same, like the path that was compiled from and a bunch of little metadata like that. That just suggests it was done the same way as all the previous ones, not uh, done by somebody else. Also, um, in terms of the website, I believe staff at SourceForge said, we don't detect was, any unusual activity. Nobody's contacted us for support to take control of the page. Right. right. Yeah, there was no unusual login activity. You know, it's not like they there was a password reset done or something. Uh Part of the, the hubbub came around the fact that uh, SourceForge recently changed the way they store passwords. 
uh, from whatever they were doing, I think, to Bcrypt or uh, SHA-512 Crypt, uh, which they should have been using the whole time, but anyway. Uh, and so they were asking people to uh, change their passwords to update in the database so they would be on the new scheme. Uh, and people kind of, you know, with that, seeing that happen everywhere else, they kind of assumed that meant SourceForge was compromised. Uh, but SourceForge says no, they were just, you know, switching their algorithm because they don't want to be uh, the next Adobe with <laughs> doing their password hashing wrong. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, they say that there's nothing suspicious about the login and the upload and the changes to the page and stuff. Uh, one of the other, some of the, there's a couple things that kind of complicate matters for TrueCrypt. One of them is that the developers of TrueCrypt are anonymous. Uh, they, for some reasons, don't actually, we don't know who they are. Uh, so it's also hard to be able to confirm with, you know, who the developer is uh, when we don't know who that is to tell, you know, are you the one that did this, or is it somebody else? Uh, right. I mean, I think that's because of the type of software they've been making. I, that seems understandable. Right. Yes. It, it's understandable, but it complicates matters as far as telling who's, you know, if this is an authoritative change or whatever. Yeah, well, I, uh, I mean, one conjecture has been perhaps this is an elaborate way to smoke out some of the developers, in a sense, to get them to come out and verify themselves, like, with their public key or something like that. I don't know. That's possible, but they could probably do that while remaining anonymous and... Secondly, it's like, how did somebody get access to do this, yeah. including the private key to sign the binary? You know, taking over the SourceForge page would have been one thing, uh, but all the other things put together seem suspicious. Uh, one of the other complications is that, well, the code for TrueCrypt is available. You can look at it. Uh, the license isn't completely open source. It's got a bunch of restrictions and stuff. Uh, so it may not be possible for people to actually continue the, uh, the TrueCrypt project. Hmm even if the open source community wanted to pick it up because of the license. Uh, so there's a, a gist on GitHub that's kind of been tracking everything they could find and also just making their own speculation. And they basically came up with uh, three possible explanations for this mess. Yeah, I like these, though. Uh, the first one was that the website was hacked and somehow they also compromised the keys to sign the new binary, although that doesn't really look like that's what happened. Uh, some of the weird things are, it's like, why would they suggest changing to BitLocker? <laughs> and if you compromised the TrueCrypt website and had the private key to sign a new binary, would you make a version of TrueCrypt that's read-only or would you make a version of TrueCrypt that like stole the files or something, right? Or, or you know, pull a, what was that malware that encrypted people's files and extorted oh. money out of them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, boy, it's funny how, ago. yeah, bit something, right? Yeah. Um, well, if you did that, you could just, you know, have the next version of TrueCrypt, as soon as you mount the volume, it changes the password on you and be like, give me bitcoins if well, you want your files okay, back. Okay, so first, I mean, if you're going to bring up the question now, I'll, I want to ask you a little bit further on this. Yeah, why would you recommend BitLocker uh, if you are supposedly so paranoid about your privacy that you've kept yourself so anonymous, then you would probably not, A, recommend a closed proprietary solution because a lot of people who are in this space liked TrueCrypt because it was open source. Yep. So that's one thing. So why would you recommend a proprietary solution? And number two, or B, whatever I was at, Microsoft is known to work with the NSA. So, like, why are they recommending a company that has been known to work right. with the NSA? Whatever that means. Tends towards more my explanation. And well, then the other thing is that the Mac OS, like, I'm not sure I haven't checked, but I, I read that the Mac OS 10 instructions for creating an encrypted volume were just to make a folder and call it encrypted or make a new virtual disk and just name it encrypted. Like, it was a total joke. Was, they weren't yeah. even real recommendations. Uh, um, I didn't look at the OS X one because I wouldn't know what it looks like. But and then the other thing, like, if you're going to throw in the flag... Open utilities, go to disk utilities, create a new image. Where is... Yeah, you're uh, looking at it right now on the site? Size of data encrypted by TrueCrypt and select... No, you select encryption from the drop-down. Oh, okay, all right. That's, See, that was what I, I was reading that. It makes that, a new so, volume and, and you yeah. format it with encryption. Um, I, I this this whole thing sounds and and then like no mention of Linux even though the TrueCrypt has been available for other no, operators. Uh, if you have files encrypted on Linux, switch to DM Crypt or one okay. of those other things. All right. See, I, that's I didn't Use read that far. Down. Integrated support for encryption. Search available installation packages for words encryption or crypt and install one of those packages. And switch so to essentially, that. what they're doing then is they're just recommending. So what they're what doing you is should switch to because they're not going to keep. Well, they're not even encryption. just do, not even so much that they're just recommending whatever the operating system's built in encryption is, regardless yes. of the merits of it. Yeah, that's what they're doing. It just yes. seems really weird, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, well, it depends on which of the four possible explanations that we've thought of they 
came up with, okay. or that actually explains it. So number two was something bad happened to the TrueCrypt developers, such as like, you know, take down or they were killed or something, or TrueCrypt itself was fun to have some like super critical vulnerability that wouldn't be fixed or something like that. Uh, they were in the middle of is, an audit. Uh, part of it is, you know, that signed with the valid signatures and stuff suggests that it was the real author and that he was either doing this because he wanted to or because he was being forced to. Uh, also, there was apparently subtle changes to the licensing text. Yes. Uh, which makes sense if you're going to abandon the project. Although, if you wanted it to continue as open source, uh, the license should have been changed more, more to, yes. to allow it to be continued. That's another than, thing that's fishy a little bit. Well, the biggest one that's fishy here is that TrueCrypt was strictly against using the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module, on the computer to store the keys because there was a suspicion that the NSA... Uh, would have you know that the there would be extra keychains on that TPM that would allow the NSA. This is why I think it's weird they're recommending. This is why it's odd they're recommending yeah. BitLocker. Yeah. Uh, well, part of it also is that um, you can't use the full disk OS encryption in TrueCrypt if you have EUFI in Secure Boot, right? Because it's not signed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's kind of suggesting that with TrueCrypt's been overtaken by events, right? Uh, now the XP is dead, and and every OS has built-in full disk encryption and those work better than TrueCrypt. Maybe you should just switch to them or whatever. And, you know, if you're doing full disk encryption, it's probably to protect yourself against your laptop being stolen, not against the NSA. Because if it's the NSA, does it really matter which disk encryption you used? <laughs> you know, if they're in your firmware, then there's nothing you can do, right? Or, you know, we always have the rubber hose cryptography, right? That will just, you know, beat you until you tell them the password. And that's why... You should use FreeBSD's GDBE encryption. <laughs> Have I told you about that one? No. Uh, well, so there's very Gelly, which is the one mm. that you know that's like every other disk. And then there's GDBE, which is what they call embassy grade encryption. Uh, so it basically has a kill switch where you can put in the right password and destroy the key, and make the disk unreadable forever. Nice. You, you destroy the key. Uh, so that then when, you're cap when your embassy is captured by the bad guys and they have you hostage and they say, give me the password, you can give them the right password. And when they try it, they'll say, that is the right password instead of that is the wrong password. Right. It's a, but sorry, the key is destroyed. You can't have the data. Toast the files. So the, the only goal there is to try to save your life by you actually gave them the password, but sorry, the data's gone. Mm -hmm. You can't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just saying, you know, if you, uh, you know, the wrong password still shows up wrong. The right password looks right. It just can't decrypt it. I like that. Keys. Yes. yes. It's, uh, probably doesn't apply to most people, but, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know, Alan. I mean, just I, so, so this one brought up, uh, the idea of that the TrueCrypt developer was being forced to do, uh, this or being forced to do something, uh, is that this was some sort of, uh, warrant canary. If you remember we talked about this a while ago yes. where uh, a project would write on his website that, you know, we've not been coerced to do anything by the NSA. And then if that ever disappeared, you would know that they had then been forced to do something by the NSA, but were under a gag order where they couldn't say that they were being forced to do it by the NSA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, this one, it's like, it doesn't, it says true crypt may be unsafe because there might be unpatched holes in it, right? Uh, and that kind of suggests that... I've I'm heard sorry. a lot of folks in the Jupiter Broadcasting community uh, theorizing Warrant Canary. Um, yeah. I wanted to back up, though. You mentioned... It sounds like kind of like... Well, I, you know, I'll let you... I'll, I'll, I'll save it to the end. I'll, I, have, I have a couple more questions for you, but I'll let you continue. Yep. Because we can discuss it at the end of, of the roundup here. Uh, but it, what it more likely seems like is that the author is just not interested in doing it anymore. <laughs> right? Uh we, like when you look at the history of TrueCrypt, the last time the major version came out, seven, uh, when they started the seven branch, was over three years ago now. And the last release of a version of TrueCrypt, uh, seven point one A, was more than a year ago. It doesn't really seem like it's being actively maintained at all, does it? And with the license allowing open source not to continue with it, it's you know kind of dead in the water. Like, and that message makes sense now, right? There may be unpatched vulnerabilities in this because the author hasn't looked at it in over a year and doesn't intend to. So do you think the audit that's going underway may be 
press well, this that issue was the for the for the that, that uh, the audit was underway, had found something, and so he was telling people to stop using it before the audit came out. Or maybe he was uh, just stressed they would, and you know he's just like I'm done with it. You know, possibly just knowing but, somebody's looking over my shoulder right now. Uh, the first half of the audit, or the first section of the audit, has been finished and didn't find any backdoors. But it wasn't actually looking at the cryptography, only at like the general structure of the program to see if there were any obvious mistakes or obvious backdoors. Uh, whereas if there's something hidden in the actual crypto that required you know a different analyst to actually look at, right? Because it's a different skill set. Uh, so that's another theory, but we'll find out eventually about that one because the uh, the open crypto uh, audit project is right. is auditing it and yeah, they'll let continues us know, on wait why so clunky why uh why say well, things if, like if development ended 514 and why, right. why 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 so inaccurate and, and really pinning it on windows xp i mean i i grok what you're saying you it's can't not, do full disk encryption with right, uh, beyond it's, it's xp like, but that seems like that a minor we, thing now that windows xp is dead there's no reason to use TrueCrypt. that's that's the author's speculation but that or, seems or inc- that seems like an inconceivable conclusion i mean that seems that seems unbelievable because it's like like you said in the setup but, but like you said in the setup, TrueCrypt is the one true encryption system we could trust on to move between operating systems. I could encrypt on a Linux box and give it to you, and you could decrypt it on a Windows box or vice versa. And that makes TrueCrypt almost indispensable right there. And TrueCrypt has, has some really nice features, like the plausible deniability features and things like that. Right. And it seems like, the I mean, personally for me, the last thing I need from TrueCrypt is full disk encryption. That's like the in all of the things TrueCrypt does. That's the last thing on the list for me, and why? And so because XP is gone, you can't do full disk encryption anymore. Seems like a ludicrous conclusion. And for somebody who's theoretically spent more than a decade working on something that's open source, to then not enable that project to continue on and and you know to to make the the, the small changes needed to the open source license so that way the rest of the community could pick it up well, after know. all your years of Changing work? the license is hard. It depends on how much of the license he actually owned to be able to change it. And, hmm. you know, if he's done with it, then he doesn't want to spend any effort on it, right? Well, so how do we really know it's one website. person? Because I've read, I've read it's multiple people. Right. Well, nobody knows, and that makes this that much more difficult. And I'm, Well, I mean, I, I could see a scenario where it's maybe a partnership and there's a bit, or, 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 or a group of people, and there's a bit of a split... Right. Yeah. Going that was on one of the right other now. option was that there was a, basically a power struggle or something yeah. inside the project because you, you would have you would have key access, you would have logins. Right. Uh, why the uh, website would redirect to SourceForge? Maybe the guy had access to SourceForge, but not enough to overwrite stuff on the old web server or something. But you know, it depends. Uh, it, generally, it comes down to if if there were other people on the project, do you think they might have said something by now? <laughs> well, I mean, it's only sit- been a day. But. They're sitting back and going, "Crap! Do I want to out myself?" Right, but you could do it if they've managed to stay anonymous so far. I'm sure they could stay anonymous while still saying something, right? The only thing that could make this story more interesting if is if Bitcoin was somehow involved, like a Bitcoin <laughs> ransom. <laughs> well, that's what I expected. If if someone had hacked the website, that's what I would have expected. Yeah, exactly. This yeah, something like Crypto Locker, a Bitcoin. Yeah. Crypto uh, Locker, you got it. Yeah, there you go. The Cri- chat room got it. Okay, I did. Okay. Um, uh, hmm. Gosh. But yeah, um, but yeah, with the last major version being three years old, it seems like there hasn't really been a lot of movement in TrueCrypt in three years. Yeah. Like, I understand software gets stable and doesn't have to be updated every month or That's something. That's what I thought. But, at, but with cryptography and stuff, you'd think there'd be at least small patches every once in a while. Yeah, to go more I, yeah, than I do. a year without a release I, really suggests something hinky. That has, that has persistently bugged me for a long time now. But um, at the same time, it's been on my mind. It's also, it's something people don't notice, right? Oh, I've noticed. Well, if you go to download it, you would notice. But yeah. if you're just using it day to day, you might not notice that, hey, there hasn't been an update for this. Yeah. If you're going to the website and seeing, you know, go to download it and see the release date on the version is like two years old, then you're like, oh, what's going on here? But Well, and that, 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 that I mean, I don't mean to harp on this whole XP thing, but that's a whole other thing. Like, who in, the, who in the security field gives two craps about people on XP? If you're still on XP and you're, you're concerned about security, then you've got other problems. Right, like right. again, to end one of the world's most recognized encryption product projects, that which, by the way, 
has been getting more attention than ever because Edwards, it's come out recently that Edward Snowden threw an encryption party in Hawaii and he taught people how to use TrueCrypt. We know that Glenn Greenwald used TrueCrypt to secure the documents. So it's been covered more than ever. At a time, it's been more popular than ever. And the fact that, and by the way, those guys are using it on Macs. So the fact that it doesn't work on XP is, is that XP is gone, doesn't matter to them at all. Again, I just go back to this XP thing out and I do not buy it. The whole thing seems fishy. And it's almost the whole it almost predicate it almost begins by predicating the fact that XP's gone away. Like, well, you know. Well, it just means that the best no Windows ever is gone now. For TrueCrypt because every OS that's supported now has their own built-in disk encryption. Yeah. I mean, I think the sad Which part is Which is a valid is, statement, but isn't necessarily a valid reason for ending TrueCrypt. But Yeah. Honestly, with the way it's set up, it's like why would why do people trust TrueCrypt in the first place? Well, that's true. <laughs> It's written by a bunch of people you don't know and does or a bunch person. of things and has a really weird license. Like Linux people use people that normally harp on and on about open source licenses and then use TrueCrypt just seems weird to me. Just because of the way the license is set up. Yeah, no, I I mean I actually think all things considered this could be I a developer who's not a very... I know exactly what happened and that the conspiracy theories will go on forever. True. But I think there is a I think if you weigh up all of the conspiracy theories, I think the one theory that to me would tip the scale in one direction is essentially a burned out developer, not a very good communicator, maybe stressed out right. about that audit it's coming. Like, why does the web page look so bad? Because if I'm quitting a project, I'm not going to spend a week making a nice yeah. web page for yeah. my resignation. You're too right? busy dropping the mic. You've, you're done. You're checking out. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just the, the it, I just go back to it. Just why not then just say, okay, have at it, world. It's yours right. now. Well, Here, here's my baby. Be is that with copyright law, it might not be possible for him to like if yeah, he doesn't own it, right. he can't change the license. You're right. You're right. Uh, just but yeah, weird it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yes. Uh, there are some interesting projects. There's um, a thing for Dragonfly BSD that uses TrueCrypt, uh, or it's it's compatible with TrueCrypt. I don't know it. Possible, it doesn't use any of the TrueCrypt code, but all of its own, which means that it might be possible to extract a TrueCrypt implementation from that hmm. for somebody to actually make an open source TrueCrypt uh, that is under a BSD license that people could use. Uh, yeah, and I know, I don't know why, but I know over on the wiki.mandriva.com, there's a real crypt project, which is an application for Mandriva, which I don't even, I don't even know, uh, which is based on TrueCrypt. It only differs in a few small ways. Like a, attributions where they have to. So there are some projects out there that are are, are based on it. But right. Um, I didn't have time to read the whole license, and the license file has like six licenses in it, and doesn't really indicate which applies to which part. <laughs> Convenient. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and you know, a bunch of people talked about the change of the license, but they didn't have a diff between the two, for so you could actually see what the difference was. Yes, I know. I know. Mandriva is Mandrake chat room. Jeez. Well, uh, this has been an interesting... Oh, and Krebs also had a good write-up on it. We should point people to. Yes, uh, I have the link to that in the show notes. Yes, so uh, uh, I mentioned to that. He basically believes that TrueCrypt is over as well. Yeah, and he does Although seem... He's mostly quoting uh, the guy who is leading the audit for it, uh, who says that he believes that this is real and that it's not a... Who is a self-admitted, quote-unquote, TrueCrypt crit critic. Right, he well, yeah. He started the audit of TrueCrypt because right. he expected it to be horrible. Uh, although he admits that so far he hasn't been able to find anything wrong with it. Well, but uh, yeah, next phase begins. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, uh, we've got a lot more. In fact, some really good news for OpenSSL to get into. But first, I want to thank Ting. Go to techsnap.ting.com. That lets them know you appreciate them supporting the TechSnap program. But even better, it'll get you $25 off your first Ting device. If you've already got a phone that'll work on Ting, then it'll get you $25 Ting credit. And Ting has a swap program going on right now. So you've got a device that's maybe on a network that wouldn't traditionally be compatible with Ting. Ting is partnered up with Glide, and they will do a phone swap of a few select models. They have more information on their blog, and then Ting will credit you the difference. So what? let me tell you a little about Ting, because if, if you haven't figured it out yet, this is mobile that just simply makes sense. It's my mobile service provider, and here's what I love. It's a flat $6 per month. What? Six dollars per month. Six dollars per month. And then it's just my usage on top of that. Ting takes my minutes, my messages, my megabytes. They add them all up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket I fall into, friends, that's just what I pay, plus any applicable taxes. And, of course, my plan includes things like hotspot, tethering, the picture messaging, your text messaging, all that kind of stuff. So that means I can get in contact with the ladies. 
by ladies, I mean my daughters and my wife. And of course, the thing that I really appreciate is the control panel. Ting has a beautiful control panel that works on mobile or your desktop. Plus, they have an app that goes with it where you can see exactly where your account's at. You can control things like where where a phone call would go if say you don't answer the phone where do you want what do you want to happen do you want it to go to your voicemail do you want it to forward to another phone do you want to send them a message do, whatever do you want to get an alert if you're at a certain uh, megabyte usage all that kind of stuff is available in the ting control panel that's one of the things that i appreciate the most plus if i ever got stuck i haven't needed it yet actually because that control panel really kind of takes care of me but if i ever got stuck get ready for this you know how much we love canadians here on the TechSnap program alan how much do we love canadians I don't know. I love Canadians a whole lot. Yeah, I think you probably love a few Canadians specifically. And and if you want to love a Canadian, guess what? If you call them, if you call Ting right now, if it's like, say, oh, I don't know, 8 a.m. between 8 p.m. East Coast time, that's Alan's time zone. If you call 1-855-TING-FTW, a real Canadian answers the phone. And guess what? That Canadian has the power to solve your problems. There's a metaphor in there somewhere. And uh, check out the Ting blog, too. They always have some great videos, including uh, down here they have one of the uh, folks in their support team, which is really neat. You can go there and, and see these folks and get, a, get to know a little bit about the people behind Ting. They also have some great info on their blog about some of the small businesses that use Ting because the great thing about Ting is if you have, like, a few of phones, especially if you have 10 or more, you can save a ton of money. In fact, go over to techsnap.ting.com and try out that savings calculator and see how much you would save. If you're like one of our producers for the Linux Action Show, he's going to save almost $4,000 in two years by switching to Ting. techsnap.ting.com. And a really big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program, techsnap.ting.com. And they got some great new devices. And plus, you can bring over some new devices. So go check out some of their new BYOD devices, like the HTC One, my friends, which is an awesome phone. So thank you, Ting, very much. Okay, Alan. So uh, we have some good news and a little more details on OpenSSL's future funding, don't we? A little bit. So the uh, core infrastructure initiative, which you remember is that uh, um, group in the Linux Foundation that's funded by Google and Apple and huge list of places yeah. uh, to try to make sure that we don't have another heartbleed by getting some resources looking at a lot of the parts of uh, open source that are critical to everything. Uh, and so they've actually finally made their first move. Um, the CII has announced its advisory board that will help it decide uh, how to spend the money uh, and the list of projects that they're going to support to start with. Uh, so the advisory board currently includes a uh, longtime kernel de uh, Linux kernel developer and open source advocate Alan Cox. Uh, Matt Green of the Open Crypto, uh, Open Crypto Audit Project, uh, which is we mentioned as part of the, they were doing the audit on um, TrueCrypt. Mm. Uh, Dan Meredith from the Radio Free Asia's Open Technology Fund. Evan Moglin of the uh, Software Freedom Law Center. Oh, Eben. Bruce, Eben? Yeah, uh, Eben yep. Moglin? Yep. Uh, Bruce Schneier of the Berkman Center for hey. Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. Uh, Eric Sears of the MacArthur Foundation, and Ed So from Google and the Linux kernel community. Holy crap. So wait a minute. So a group of companies who depend on this code have gotten together and got an advisory board of people that we actually yeah, so, respect? So so the uh, the companies gave the Linux Foundation a pile of money, yeah. and the Linux Foundation got this advisory board to decide how to spend it. But I, I right. like these people. Google, we, we, we don't want Google and them to decide how to spend it. Yeah. The advisory board of these no, people. No, I like these uh, people. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Uh, like that actually worked out so far. Yeah. I'm astonished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great news, Alan. Keep going. Yep. Uh, so they've picked out the three projects that they're going to focus on to start. Uh, and those are the network time protocol. Yes. So NTP. Yes. Uh, OpenSSH and OpenSSL. Uh, and... Uh, to that end, they've uh, uh, gave OpenSSL enough money to hire two full-time developers to work on it. Right on. Uh, and they're also paying the Open Crypto Audit Project to conduct a security audit of OpenSSL itself. Right on. Um, of course, that security audit will probably be difficult uh, due to the lack of consistent style and, and you know, tabbing and stuff in the files. <laughs> uh, the OpenSSL files are very difficult to read. It's just a maze of... Because it's patches from all over the place from all different people and, you know, over the last 20 years, it's just, you know, very crusty. Yes. Uh, 
whereas you know code that uh, one of the things that the OpenBSD guys are doing is they refactored all of the code into what they call kernel normal form, which is uh, uh, basically rules about you know how many tabs to use here, where the op- the curly braces go, and stuff like that. Uh, so that when you're reading it, you can very easily see, you know, all right, this code is inside this if, and, and right. Whereas, you know, when people use all these different tabbing stuff or, you know, think it tabbed in too far and then all of a sudden this, there's a line way over on the left and it's like, <laughs> well, is that just because it ran out of yeah. tabs? Or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, basically they don't, uh, OpenSSL didn't have a style convention that they enforced. Uh, so different files and different chunks of files are all in different styles. Whereas uh, what OpenBSD did is enforce their style on every file. Uh, which, you know, most files uh, in FreeBSD are, you know, there's a very explicit style guide, although certain code that we pull in uh, from other projects doesn't go through that just to avoid having a big diff. That way we can pull in future changes more easily. But Now, uh, anyway. we linked, I think it was two weeks ago or last week, to the talk at BSD Can where they yep. went into some uh, well, of that. Uh, we linked to one of the videos. Okay. Uh, there's a second video uh, that includes the lapel mic audio oh. and the slides at high resolution instead of... Just a somebody's. I think it was a cell phone camera. Is that out uh, in the first one? Yes. So that's out. Actually, all the videos from BSD can are out. Where do we go? Uh, Where do we link. go? I'll put a link in the uh, roundup in the roundup or uh, in the um, the feedback section. Okay. Uh, I created a Google playlist of the twenty videos because Yay. there were twenty videos. Look at you. Nice. Okay. So we'll have that in the feedback section. Uh, yeah, because that is particularly a challenge for a, a, a very old open source project. That yeah. has a lot of users all over the world. Well, and specifically, you know, the the reason why FreeBSD doesn't do it to all uh, contributed code is, or any code they pull from other vendors, uh, is the same reason why it didn't happen in OpenSSL. If you, you know, made all these white space changes to clean the code up, now anybody who had an outstanding diff has conflicts, right? And they have to manually go through and clean up, right. and it's just all yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah. Very much so. There you go. There's the link in the uh, chat room for those of you watching live right now. See, this is a great reason to show live, show up live, because then you get to like distract us during the show. Think about the benefit of that. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the Open Crypto Audit Project is the uh, includes Matthew Green, who's obviously on the advisory board, Ken White, and some other people, uh, and they will now have the money to do an audit of OpenSSL. And there are the guys that are currently doing the audit of TrueCrypt, uh, which was originally, uh, you know, the whole. Open Crypto Audit Project which actually started out of a, a Kickstarter campaign to audit TrueCrypt. Right. Uh, and now it's going to be used uh, to for OpenSSL. Uh, you know, well, it seems like they probably still have an obligation to finish checking TrueCrypt. Uh, but, you know, it, it'll depend uh, what happens over the next couple of weeks. If TrueCrypt is really dead, maybe they can refocus their efforts on OpenSSL instead. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, they might have... There might actually be like a contract there that says that oh, hey, we, man. we paid you all this money to do true yeah. crypt. You have to do it, right? Well, and I, I just I can't imagine that we're not going to see, regardless of license and whatnot, uh, offshoots of forks of, of true crypt. I mean, there's just yeah. there's no way. There's so many deployments of it right now. People are going to want something that's compatible. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, I was telling my friend about it earlier, and he's like, "Well, I use it." For my USB sticks in case I lose them. Exactly. And so I'm actually not that worried about it if there's an NSA backdoor because that's not who I'm worried about protecting the data on the USB stick from. Right. It's just, you know, if I forget it somewhere or lose it yeah. this way. Somebody- I mean, we, 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 the NSA comes up a lot, but it, 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 for practical purposes, a lot of us couldn't it give. It comes back to that care James less. Lickens video from the other week, right? We had that video from him at uh, Monitorama. You remember it was really yeah. funny we watched like the first couple seconds yes, of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, it comes down to are, are, are you being massaged upon or not? If you're not, it's like a virus scanner and not clicking on links and emails, you're probably pretty safe, right? And maybe, you know, yeah, true crypt your USB stick in case you drop it. <laughs> if you're being massaged upon, you're screwed. And th- y- right. there's not really much point trying to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to stop yourself from being massaged upon you, that that's more of a political thing right <laughs> Remember, upon. Uh, uh paul hennigkamp from the FreeBSD project had that essay in um q magazine acm yep. uh about how the answer to the nsa is not more encryption it's neutering the nsa politically instead because you know we can keep adding more encryption and they'll just keep adding ways to break it like hacking into your firmware and key logging the uh your passphrase 
for the encryption. And then what gets the encryption, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, one of the interesting ones is they talk about the network time protocol, but they didn't say do they which implementation. I'm guessing they just mean the standard NTPD. Uh, but OpenBSD has their own. They rewrote uh, specifically. It has few fewer features uh, on purpose, uh, and it's specifically designed. It has privilege separation and everything. And it seems like uh, you know maybe that catching on would be uh, just as good too. Mm. Absolutely, uh, but it'll definitely be interesting to see what an audit of OpenSSH turns up. Uh, yes. Although they're not actually doing an audit there, they're just going to uh, be providing money for OpenSSH, which is a good thing. Yes, very much so. But at the same time, we've talked about before about this monoculture. If that there's no alternative to OpenSSH really, like there's like like Drop Bear, which is for embedded stuff and has lots of its own problems. Mm -hmm. You know, OpenSSH kind of replaced the commercial SSH or replaced the vanilla SSH when it went commercial. And there's no other real alternative to it. No, I mean, and, so uh, we better make sure it's damn good, for one. Uh, there's that, but I think we should also... Uh, support something else. That that maybe there should be something else. Uh, and, you know, OpenBSD guys have been talking about doing something, an, an, a good alternative to OpenSSL, uh, but then that was overtaken by events, being that we don't have the two years it's going to take to yeah. write an alternative. Right. Uh, we need to fix the one we already have now. Uh, you also mentioned that they would be funding an NTP project, but I missed which project is it? Because there's several. It, it, it doesn't actually say. I think okay. they actually just mean like NTPD. I think the one from ISC or whoever. Does okay, because I mean, you know, because like, we've had those the stock one. <laughs> we've had those NTP amplification attacks recently. So I mean, that's it's that that daemon is the one that they'd be looking at. Yes, that's also an area that needs attention as well. Because uh, that almost was the same thing, right? It was some uh, rarely used feature that right. was enabled yeah. by default on everything, yeah. and yeah. it turns out that when somebody used it, they could do the amplification attack. Yeah, that's right. Jeez. Okay, I'll... Well, random news that uh, Linux System D just grew an NTP client. Yay! Like yeah, I've heard uh, they're just going to integrate True uh, TrueCrypt into System D. So they're just uh, yeah. you don't need TrueCrypt anymore on Linux because it's just going to be part of System D. Yeah. Aha, but I'm bump kidding. You know, and your mom and a kitchen sink and, you know. Hey, man, I got System D running right here and I love it. It's great. It's right here on this machine right here. You don't know. And this machine right here. It's great. It's great. And that machine over there. They all have I got three System Ds in this room. Well, honestly, really, your, your init system shouldn't make a difference once the system's running. And no, I, I'm just playing with you. I don't care. Yeah. I don't really, whatever, hey, whatever floats your boat, whatever floats your boat. All right, well, why don't we take a second here and thank our second sponsor this week, and that is the great folks over at DigitalOcean. What is DigitalOcean? Arm yourselves with this, because once I tell you about this, you're going to want to use it. Our promo code for the month of May, Snap May. That's the secret. Snap May. Take advantage of what you can, and uh, let's, uh, let's represent for the month of May. So what is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server. I, this is unbelievable. Hold on, Alan. Hold on. Before we go any further, you're not even going to believe this. So now most users can spin up a cloud server in about 55 seconds. And uh, that'll, you know, that's not bad. And you can choose from a multiple of different distributions. Okay, hold on. This guy tweeted me last night. 36 seconds. Sir... Sir Sandlot, here, I'm going to pull it up right here on the screen. Look at this guy. This guy is crazy. Sir Sandlot created a, a DigitalOcean droplet in 36 seconds. That's unbelievable. So most people, 55 seconds. I mean, that's not bad, right? 55 seconds to get yourself a server up in the cloud that you have root access to. And for $5 a month, you get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. And their interface is great. It's simple, it's intuitive, and they have an API. So if you want to really bust it out and do something really great on your own, maybe at scale with scripting, their API supports that. And there's a bunch of great community apps. So use our promo code SNAPMAY when you check out one word. You'll get a $10 credit. You can try out that $5 rig for two months for free. Build yourself that's a free. server. Isn't that awesome? Like That is a lot of free. <laughs> that's a lot of free. You can do a lot of stuff. You really get a sense of the value for it. And here's a great example of something you could try out for for two months. Uh, they, uh, uh, over at DigitalOcean, just posted 
how to use GitLab with our one-click install image to manage your own Git repository. So they now have made it possible to do a one-click GitLab deployment on a DigitalOcean droplet. That's You could have your own Git, folks, with one click. DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SNAPMAY. Try out a GitLab for two months for free. DigitalOcean.com. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean. And check them out on Twitter, too. They got a great Twitter feed. They just, uh, earlier this morning, uh, here's some great performance tips for getting more out of WordPress. Uh, and then here's a group shot of them working at the office. That guy's got an epic beard. Go check out this guy's beard on DigitalOcean's Twitter feed. You can follow him on Twitter. They're just at DigitalOcean on the tweets. And they uh, they talk about new services and all kinds of stuff. It's a, it's actually a pretty great feed. I've frequently retweeted them because I really like what they post. DigitalOcean.com. And a really big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. And don't forget, Snap May to get that $10 credit. Okay, Alan, so we've got the top 10 misconfiguration mistakes of Windows servers. Yes. Uh, so um, there's this company called NCC Group. Uh, that they do what they call build surveys, where yeah. they go in and look at a company's network and, and check all their production servers and see if they've been configured properly. And uh, based on the last 50 of those they did, they built a, a report that did an analysis of what the common mistakes were. Okay. Uh, do you have that up? Yeah, With, I got uh, it. all the fancy yep, graphs? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, so the most popular mistake was missing Microsoft patches. <laughs> they found 82% of uh, the servers were missing at least some of the Microsoft patches. What? Yeah. Uh, now, you know, depending on what your patch cycle is, maybe, you know, you haven't got around to doing the patches from last Tuesday when it's, and it's only Thursday or whatever. But uh, they found that in most of the cases, servers were missing the last year of patches. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, well, that seems like an easy one to fix. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 82% were missing at least some of the Microsoft patches. Uh, 50% had auditing turned off or didn't have very much turned on at all. Uh, if you don't have, you know, successful or uh, failed, specifically failed login attempts turned on, how do you notice when somebody's doing a brute force attack against you? Yes, you know, I mean, the problem is in both cases, I know, I believe what's driving these is, uh, you know, IT guys, A, like, for example, I had... Uh, at one point, like a hundred and something terminal servers that I was managing. And when I would patch those, it could screw up stuff for hundreds of users. And so there's that whole problem I'm avoiding. And then the insufficient auditing, to be frank, and maybe it's gotten better in more, absolutely more recent versions of Windows, but the event log sucks. And the details you get in the event log suck. And getting data out of the event log sucks. And all that also, stuff added up. the event log had a cap. It was like, don't let this log grow to more than yeah, two depends, yeah. megabytes or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it would so it would delete old stuff, but it would avoid deleting right. stuff that was too new. What so I, this, it wouldn't delete anything that was less than two days old. And so when you got to the point of the logs full and there's nothing it can delete, yeah. it'll actually stop services from being able to well, do things. I mean, there's different settings. Which but, makes sense, but you have to go in there and jack up the amount of space it's allowed to use because yeah. it's set way too small. It's set uh, yeah. like the size you would expect on like a Windows NT4 box, and it's never been updated. I, uh, it might be now, but last time I had to deal with a Microsoft server. No, to be honest with you, the what I have done is I generally just get the logs off that machine. And there are like event log to syslog services and things like that, but... This just I just I feel like I so understand why those top two things are the top two re, uh, are mistakes yeah. because I have been the guy who's not doing the proper auditing and I have been the guy well, who isn't applying well, the, the patches. Patching, you know, I, I wrote a whole paragraph about that here. The problem with the uh, part of the problem is that you know the culture of being patch averse, right? Uh, yes. You know, because of faults in software, uh, uh, the fault of software vendors where they issue patches that break things or patches that won't install properly, or patches that depend on a previous patch and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a risk every time you want to install a patch. And, you know, when it's in production, you don't want to risk it. I mean, my and generation, in, I came from an era where a service pack could potentially render the box unbootable. It, it had happened. Well, I, and a service pack was basically the equivalent of upgrading from Windows 7 to 8 or something. It, it was, was a, a huge change. change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that and, created a culture. But, but back then also, with service packs, there were no updates but except for service packs. Right? There, you, there was no Windows update. You didn't download patches from the internet. It's like <laughs> right. once every year, Microsoft sent you a, a, a CD disc. full yeah. of all the security fixes. <laughs> oh, that was simpler time. server wasn't on the internet. Gosh, that was so nice. Your server's on the internet. This is a big deal. I want a time machine right now. Yeah. Uh, 
So part of it, but in general, Microsoft's been a lot better in recent years about making sure that, you know, we, Apaches actually apply and that they don't break things. You know, the, the days of those service packs is making servers unbootable are, it, it doesn't happen at the same frequency as it used to. Right, oh, for sure. Uh, but I think part of the problem is, you know, design of the way the system is set up. Uh, now, it doesn't work for every app, but for most apps, the idea should be that there should be two servers. So I can take one down and upgrade it and bring it back up and migrate the app over. And does it work? Good. If not, keep it over there and, and fix the problem, right? So that, you know, you can have maintenance time without having downtime. Uh, but a lot of Windows systems aren't set up that way. Part of it is the fault of the applications and stuff that they don't have support for working in that fashion. But uh, So anyway, continuing on with the list. Uh, the third one was 48% of the machines were missing updates to some third-party software they had on them. Right? Uh, that's something where Windows is probably even weaker than a lot of uh, you know, Linux and BSD and such because you don't have a package manager right. per se. No repo. You have to manually find the patches for all third-party apps that you're using or whatever. It's not easy to just say, hey, give me the updates for all the software I have on this system. Well, and, and this can happen on Linux, too, or, or FreeBSD if it's a, if it's a uh, but this may be more common on Windows, if it's a vendor application that once you stop paying the, the annual support contract, you stop getting updates. And then you just yeah. get the version that you've got. Or if it's just somehow outside your package yeah. manager because it doesn't. I don't think, I mean, I'm not even, I don't even think this is, I mean, this maybe is, I, I'm almost positive that almost every client I've had that's at least, you know, 20 to 30 people more has had some program that they have had for a very long time that is no longer under support and barely works on the most recent version of Windows. And that's yeah. another reason people don't patch because sometimes it breaks those really old legacy Also the reason some people still use Windows XP for stuff. Because yeah. Because the app doesn't work on 7 because yeah. of one change or another. And sometimes the cost to get that annual support is just it's just too prohibitive to, to change it. Right. And especially, like you mentioned, some of them, you know, th it's not just sign up and pay for this year's support. It's pay for every year you miss. Yes. That the gap is really where they get you. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then, but there's a bunch that, where there's no excuse. Uh, weak <laughs> password policy. Yeah. 38% of servers didn't enforce even the default Windows password complexity, let alone a proper one. Uh, part of that is the password complexity rules are stupid oftentimes. If my password's this long, maybe I shouldn't have to have a capital and a number and a symbol. <laughs> this long being like a, a, a phrase almost. Yeah. It's like, I understand, you know, just make it something. You need at least three of uppercase, lowercase, number, and symbol or something like that. Yeah. Not that you need every one of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. That is an old school way to do passwords. Yeah. And mostly just a minimum length is probably better. A higher minimum length is probably better than enforcing a bunch of weird characters. Encourage in. a sentence. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that one's that. 34% uh, had the UAC disabled for the administrator account. Um, Guilty I can understand here. that it gets annoying, but at the same time, it's actually helpful. Yeah, it's annoying that every time you try to do something, it pops up Ooh. and it's modal. But... If you ever get one when you're not expecting it, yeah, that is nice. You appreciate it, right? This is an area, and I don't mean to be so critical about Windows, but uh, this is uh, this is an area where if Microsoft would have done a little bit better UI design, such that here's an example, it happens all the time when a user is installing a print driver, the setup wizard comes up, it's installing, and the UAC prompt comes up in the background. It flashes yes. down in the start the menu. UAC is supposed to be modal and, and take over the whole yeah. screen and darken. Right. But sometimes it doesn't happen like that. Yeah, and, and the whole system, they, people think, the most common thing is end users think their computer is broken, and then they power... Oh, it's just stalling it. Yeah, like it's, it's stalled and frozen. Even I've yeah. been like, why isn't this happening? It was yeah. like alt-tab to the... There's the window I was looking for. Right, and I've, Although, I've had Windows users that just it's first. kill the power, Windows, and then... Yeah, on Windows 8, when you get the UAC pop-up, yeah. you get a, a different terminal. So right. it's that UAC pop-up in the middle of the screen with nothing else on the screen at all. It's like a whole banner almost, right? Well, it's no, it just it's full screen with you can't see the app behind it that's causing it. Right. Even. Yeah. You just get a blank desktop yeah. with that centered and nothing else. Yeah, that might be a reason to upgrade to Windows 8 right there. <laughs> to be honest, it's I slightly mean, annoying. I like better the idea of right out. the Windows 7 one when it works yeah. is better. Yeah. yeah. For, not all of them are modal, I think, depending on of certain settings and when it decides. Or but. if like it's a setup program that mandates focus or something like that, I can't 
quite pin, pin, pin it down, but it screws up end users all the time. They go to Costco, they get their printer, they bring it home, and they get stuck at UAC. So a lot of folks turn it off to avoid that annoyance. Just, oh, yeah. well, you know this, what? In this case, they're talking about turning it off on the admin account on a Windows server. Shouldn't I would never do that. Exactly. But apparently 34% of people do, and that's bad. Uh, the next one was disabling the host-based firewall. I'm not a giant fan of Windows Firewall, yeah. but if it's a server, maybe, yeah. you know. I don't, I, I don't really buy having individual firewalls on individual servers. It's not really my yeah. thing. Mine either, but, you know, on Windows, <laughs> you take every bit you can get. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Again, basically, the main one there is that the host-based firewall can stop an app on the server from being able to connect out. Yeah, if you're restricting out, okay, I could almost see yeah. that, yeah. Right, yeah. So it's so, so that when some piece of malware gets on the server, it can't get but off the server until somebody accepts it as a firewall. Unless you specifically the host tell it firewall to. firewall is supposed to do that. Uh, it depends on the settings you have in Windows. Yeah. And oh, stuff. sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, keeping it from listening on a port is useful as well. But yeah. if you can That's stop uh, unauthorized programs from connecting out on your network, that can stop it, the virus from spreading from one server to more, right? And getting into your network, and, I, and you I, I guess, and persist. You know, and if if I was if I was limited on my time budget, I feel like you know, whenever I've had firewalls on Windows boxes, I'm constantly adding exceptions and constantly running into problems. I would rather spend that time and energy shutting off services. I would never need on that box. Like instead of blocking for, for listening to ports, just don't have those ports open in the first place. Like don't run well, the service. Specifically, services. that that's kind of what it does is it's telling you, hey, this thing that you wouldn't expect is yeah. trying to do something. No, I get yeah. Right. Yeah. Your your list of exceptions shouldn't have to be that high. Yeah. Uh, then number twenty. Uh, or the next one was twenty four percent had either clear text passwords or other sensitive information stored just in clear text in an application or. You know, in a notepad file or somewhere, I, I file some or, passwords yeah, sure. or something sure. in plain text, sure. and that's just bad. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, twenty percent of them had account lockout disabled. That should never, ever, ever happen. Ah, oh, we get too many calls. You know, we just get so many calls. Well, you can adjust the number it takes. You know, let someone try ten times. If they can't get their password right ten times in a row, then that's yeah. I, I really cannot think of this. I, I was even going to say a script. Like maybe a script is causing, but no, there should be no reason why you should have account lockout disabled. No, it's like I can understand having to turn the value up because the default's like three or five or something like that. Yeah, maybe 10. yeah. Ten gives people enough tries, but after that, it's obviously not legit and needs to be stopped. Yeah. <laughs> um. 18% had out-of-date virus scanner definitions, and 12% had no antivirus at all. <laughs> no, 12% is actually lower than I expected. That, yeah. Uh, I, I, for me, it's like virus scanner on a server? Go I away. Yeah, I, I actually very, very... The only time I ever ran virus, antivirus on a server, it was either a file server or um, mandated by audit requirements. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I know a lot of... Uh, I always laugh when the PCI DSS says install a virus scanner on your server i'm yeah. like eat me it's a huge it was a huge part of our it infrastructure yeah. actually was managing the virus definitions on our servers i mean and you know that's what norton and trend micro make a huge portion of their money on is domain-wide server d virus definition right. well, i, I can understand crap. ones that are, you know pushing out new definitions to every desktop machine and stuff yeah but yeah when you have to do it on the server right. it's like sometimes your windows server is slow enough Right. You want to put you, a fire scanner on it? I, I'm sure this has gotten much better now, but I'm, this is back in the NT4 to 2003 Windows era I, where I was really heavily involved with terminal services. And, of course, on a terminal server, it does make sense to have Inovirus because you've got right, 25, 30, 40 users. Users are logging in and running applications on this server. Right. So, so you would be surprised back then how crappy how crappy antivirus software was running in a terminal server environment, how much antivirus software assumed it was a single user on a window. Well, I'm on a Windows box, only one person logged in at a time. Here, I can do whatever I want. You yeah. know? <laughs> or, or that, you know, I should pop up the, uh, the warning and say, uh, you know, yeah. asking the user if they want to allow this file or not on the terminal Right, terminal on the window not, not desktop. The yeah, on yeah. the host so, desktop. Yeah, it's on the server desktop, not oh. on the window. Of the person who's actually remote desktoping in drives me crazy when that kind of stuff happens. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. well, uh, but anyway, the report comes down to most of these problems are trivial to fix, and it seems that everybody's still making the same mistakes over and over. Right? No, there's plenty of excuses and so on, but you know, at some point, you have to install the Microsoft patches, otherwise, bad things will happen to you. Well, and if you think about it. 
I mean, Windows has sort of sold itself over the years as a very stable platform to write applications for, and that appeals specifically to a demographic that doesn't want a lot of change. Yeah, but you still have to patch shit. I agree. I Both agree. Both the OS and the third-party application that you're using, uh, you're running on the Windows machine. Uh, you know. Yeah. You know what I would do, personally? If it were mm-hmm. me. And I mean, I'm not... I don't, know, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm, this is just a suggestion. I'd go look at a rig from iX Systems. In fact, I'd start by going to iXSystems.com slash TechSnap, where you can check out some of their awesome server that's really built to take advantage of open source software and, of course, those amazing Intel processors. Go to iXSystems.com slash TechSnap and find out more information. You know, I was just over here, Alan. They've got, like, several, speaking of BSD CAN, they've got, yep. like, three wrap-ups now of BSD yep. CAN, which is... The, the three, they sent five people, but two of them didn't make it because of airplanes. Oh, jeez. Uh, but the three people that were there all wrote a nice That is book. super cool. I, they have a great blog. I don't know if they call yeah. it a blog, but that's essentially what it's becoming. It's, yeah, it's what's new on Yeah, the what's new is the section. So uh, if you go to iXSystems.com, go to that, what's new. The Terrafiler. Is that in their what's new area? Yeah. Okay, it's, I'll go look for uh, it. It's just Terrafiler the preview. Case. Yeah. Okay. This oh, is my gosh. Uh, <gasps> just because they could. It keeps going. It it just because they could. <laughs> 776 terabytes of storage. <laughs> I was like, let me scroll down. I was like, I'll scroll down, and it just keeps going and going and going. It's a couple of going. separate storage chassis, but basically it's one system. It's a true NAS, so it's two heads, each with like 16 hard drives, connected to three sleds just full of 48 hard drives a piece or something like that. 256 gigabytes of RAM per node. Yeah, and there's two nodes. Uh, and they're all connected to each of the nodes connects to every single one of the hard drives intel xeon e5 2650 2.6 gigahertz processors oh. yeah, so there's two <laughs> processors in each of the two nodes and each one has multiple separate storage cards and it's all set up so no matter what piece of hardware dies uh the cluster keeps working and you can still access your files that's just about what i would need right here at uh at JB1. You know what's actually kind of well, funny? You could build something, uh, a slightly smaller version of that, and then you can just keep adding the sleds of disks every couple of years. Well, I call that something a little smaller than that, the free NAS Mini. That's what we run here. In fact, well, yes, yes. not only do we use it for our, long, our long-term uh, storage, okay, but we also run our virtual infrastructure off of our free NAS Mini. We, run our, our, we have several virtual machines now that just run off it all day long while we're also using it for a bunch of other activities. And I think this kind of gives you the concept of the scale that IX can work at that can work at a great little low power quiet Seriously, box like little little things like the free nas mini or my little half uh one u half depth router that i bought there up through you know the twenty thousand dollar server i bought with the you know 36 four terabyte hard drives or you can go further and get that the true there with 700 and some odd <laughs> Uh, terabytes of storage space. That's about how much I need, so that'd be perfect. That'd be great. I could, yeah. I, I could give it a shot. I don't, but I don't it also mind. just goes through, they built that machine just for fun so they could do that anti-vibration test. Oh, for the drives? Yes. So, so you remember that uh, video we showed a while ago you of yell uh, at the Brendan drives? Gregg screaming at hard drives and how it changed the latency? Yeah. Well, uh, one of uh, the partners of IAX has this uh, anti-vibration rack that's supposed to get rid of some of the vibration so that that's a less of an impact. Yeah. So to test it, uh, if you go back in the in the What's New page, you'll find the video of this. Uh, Matt uh, Olander at IX set up uh, a bunch of the employees are in a like play musical instrument. So they have like a drum kit and a guitar. Oh my gosh! And all pointed at this rack. Oh my gosh! This is awesome. And they're going to try to vibrate it. This is too cool. I'm going to play a little bit of it. Okay. Systems in San Jose, California. We're about to and test this the, is the green reason why Matt's position is called Chief Science Officer. <laughs> using science, and this is how we do it. They're, they got a drum kit in the server room with a bunch of speakers too. Yep. Pointed at the terrifier. Oh, so that is too it. funny. That's it for now. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see the results of that. That is. That is such a great idea. That is such a clever idea on so many levels. So go over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap, see what we're talking about, uh, and also check out that ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source software. I mean, that's yeah. the great thing about IX. They is seriously rename that to the ultimate guide to convincing your management. <laughs> right. IX really, if you want a system that's powered by open source software, or, you know, honestly, you can run pretty much any x86 operating system on them, but I... I mean, these guys really know their stuff when it comes to the open source implementations. These guys are an expert on this kind of stuff. 
Go over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And a really big thank you to IX Systems. And I can't wait to see the rest of that video. Do you know when we're going to see that? How long do we have to wait? I don't know. It's been a while already. I've I got to yell at them. <laughs> I want it right but, now. But, you know, Matt was supposed to go into BSD Can, but uh, he made it as far as Washington, D.C., and then they canceled his flight. Boy, both him and Chris had a hard time, huh? Yes, they did. That's too bad. And so when <laughs> at one point they're like, well, you can wait around on standby for two days and we might get you there uh, the day the conference ends. <laughs> and he's like, can I go home? Yeah. No, no like thanks. if you run, you might be able to. Yeah. So he ran across the airport and managed to make it home. Uh, Alan, before we run to the feedback, I want to remind folks that you can join us live. Go over to jblive.tv. We stream the TechSnap program on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. And uh, you can go to jblive.info to get the audio stream. We have one that's probably a little more suited for, like, if you're sitting at your desk or if you have a great mobile connection. Then we have a lower bitrate one if you're in the car commuting and you want to listen on the go. And it is 1 a.m. Pacific, and that works out to be? Uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2800 UTC. Boom. Right there. That's the business. And uh, we'd love to have you join us because you can hang out in our chat room and chat with us between segments. Like, we're just about to jump into a break before we go to feedback. We'll chat with the chat room, and they also get to help us title our show and then we vote on that at the end it's kind of like survivor only with less uh flame and music and cameras well no we actually have cameras so it's kind of like survivor just like that so we'd love to have you join us live over jblive.tv on a thursday but alan with the news all done that means it's time for the tech snap feedback Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop in that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or even better, like our first email this week. Starting a thread in our brand new subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. But Alan, we did have some BSD can uh, follow-up slash feedback to get to before we got yep. to the emails. First one's a nice picture here. Who's this yes. great looking group of people? This is uh, from the FreeBSD Developers Summit. Uh, so there were about 120 of us. Uh, not everybody made it for the picture, but... Uh, yeah, we had the developer summit and worked on uh, all the interesting stuff and uh, kind of decided what you, would are, uh, make up FreeBSD 11. Are you in there? Because I don't... Uh, yep. Let's see. It's like, finally, where's, uh, like, where's Waldo? Vote, vote in the uh, middle on the far right side. Well, not quite the middle. I'm on the right side in the middle-ish. <laughs> I see you. I yeah. found you. Is that a... Let's see. Uh, that would have been epic if that would have been a like a uh, Jupiter Broadcasting shirt. That's all. It's just been epic. It's um, nice, though. It's a good picture. What shirt is that? Look at all them beards. Well, Look that's, at all that's them. That's the uh, New York City BSD Con shirt. Predominantly male, though, I got to say, Alan. Predominantly yeah. male. Some yeah. good beards, though. Uh, Drew was busy running the registration desk, so she uh, put it in the picture. Mm. All right. And then we've so also... Left, uh, I think Diane and that was it this year. <laughs> We've also got that playlist that, uh, from the BSD Can videos that you put together on your on your Alan Jid YouTube channel. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Um, and uh, boy, there's a whole bunch of good ones in here. Yep. Ooh, upcoming features to ZFS and performance enhancements. I like that. Yeah. There's so there, there's like 20 videos in the list. Yep. Uh, I think that's all of them. I might have missed one actually. Dan will let me know. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's lots of good talks in there. Uh, I have a recording of the FreeBSD Developer Summit section on ZFS, uh, which is similar to the one in uh, Asia, although talked about different stuff. And you know, some stuff has changed over the last two months, although not that much. Uh, but yeah, uh, we 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 kind of drained Matt Aaron's. We're like, okay, so on uh, on 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 Thursday you'll give a talk at the Dev Summit. On Friday you'll host a Birds of a Feather session, and on Saturday you'll give a talk. <laughs> It's like, we want at least four hours of Matt Aaron's in our conference. <laughs> uh, nice. And then, uh, oh, the funny part was then, so then he, so he had to talk on like Saturday and Sunday and everything, or yeah, so he had to talk on Friday and Saturday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. On Sunday, he had the day off, uh, except he spent the day flying to Paris in France, <laughs> and then he was giving talks three days in a row after that too. <laughs> wow, that's intense. Yeah. Plus, his baggage didn't arrive until Friday. Oh, my gosh. That's the worst. Tuesday. Yeah. So in that picture there, you can see him wearing that gray and green striped shirt. That's all he had. He was, yeah, he was wearing that the next day as well. Oh, man. That's horrible. And then as soon as his luggage arrived, he's like, I'm going to go change my shirt. Yeah. All right. I want we start with our first question. Or actually, this is yes. follow-up. And I think this is – I wanted to read this one because I, I, was, I felt like it was channeling 
a lot of people last week. Uh, KOD yeah. Carnage writes in. He says, it was so frustrating listening to the show last week, hearing Chris Lass have a problem finding how to replace the drive. He said, I just replaced all my drives with Western Digital Reds as well, and I already knew that the documentation was a little out of date on this topic. And then he tells me where to go. We actually, what we did is uh, after the break, during the during the show break, uh, we found it, and I went out in out. Well, if there. you find the right documentation, it was correct. But, yeah, and uh, and so it was. I also happen to know that Drew is in the middle of the cycle of refreshing those docs yeah, right now. Yeah, and so I found where it was at, bent down in the in the lower area, and I replaced the disc. It works flawlessly now, and I got to go back and say I was still really impressed that it wasn't always perfect. Like every now and then, it seemed like the system would kind of like. Maybe run out of buffer, but uh, I mean, there was times when running off of, with one drive down, I was still getting 117, 120 megabytes. I mean, be- best I could expect over Ethernet with well, one I drive down. I find a drive and get, I'd still get like 400 and plus megabytes a second. So I, don't, it, I have more drives than you, so that. it performed. I mean, I was really happy with that. And then when I and then I thought, okay, well, when I replace the drive, that's when I'm going to have to sit around for a couple of days while this thing just sits here and chugs and chugs. One of the biggest differences with ZFS is that it only has to rewrite the bits that were actually being used, right? With regular hardware RAID, it has to rewrite every single block on the whole hard drive. Yeah, man, it like know which ones a, are still a, a Drobo uh, of that size could potentially be out for fifty hours when you replace a yeah. drive like that. It essentially Wh- whereas just chugging. with ZFS, it knows which blocks are have files and which ones are not used anymore, and so it can speed up that process a lot. Uh, uh, a lot, there's lot. Also, there's SysCTLs that tune. Uh, the resilver and the scrub process. See, because I think the default value is sleep for two milliseconds between each operation, uh, if the drive has any other activity on it. So it decides, you know, has something used this data storage pool in the last 250 milliseconds? If not, then go full speed because nobody else is using it. Ah, we might as well get it done. As gosh, that's as awesome. But I'm- if somebody has used it. Each time we issue an operation to the uh, to the disk, sleep for two milliseconds afterwards, uh, or two thousandths of a second afterwards. So to just taper it back a little bit, so that uh, that leaves time for other ops. Basically, it limits the IOPS uh, to like two hundred and fifty or something, or no, five hundred or something like that. It, it limits mm-hmm. the IOPS, and that way, uh, the the resilver doesn't slow the thing down so much that you can't use it during the time. But it, it's tunable, so you can turn it up and down and be like, I need this resilver to finish quicker because I was only using RAID Z1, and if a second disk dies, I'm in trouble. So you can crank it up and let it go. Or you can be like, we're, you know, it's business hours and we need performance. Let's tune it back, and then I'll turn it up and let it run higher tilt after hours or whatever. Uh, nuts, yes, ZFS has some support for unmap uh, for thin provisioning on ZVols. Uh, it's going to get even better, though. And I, I would have to say, um, because the whole because the whole uh, you know, the, the thing was fairly new in its life cycle, there wasn't a lot of data to put back on the drive. So in a few hours, it, I think it was done. Yep. It was really great. So yeah, sorry and, about uh, that. Yeah, but we did get it working. versions of ZFS are getting even more tunables for tuning performance. So you can even just tuning read versus write and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's going to get even more powerful. Very good. Well, uh, Sean writes in, and I don't, I don't know if we're fully equipped to answer this question, but we'll give it a go. He says, hey, guys, the show is awesome. I'm a web developer and I have a couple of Microsoft certs, but I don't use them at all. I've always been interested in the server administration, and because of your show, I'm now really into Linux and FreeBSD. I have no other qualifications other than the techie aptitude and my MS certs. I, wanted to get into, I want to get into Linux or BSD administration, but I'm 43 years old. Two questions. Number one. Is it too late? At number two, would you recommend doing in what would you recommend doing in order to learn and get started on this new career? I'm also in radio, and I laugh at people that go to college or go to radio schools to learn radio, and I don't want to make the same mistake becoming a server admin. Is it the best time to go back to college? Thanks for your time. Uh, college is usually pretty bad at teaching server admin. As someone who taught server admin in college. <laughs> um, you know, it just can never get in depth enough, and you uh, eventually, you know, you, you have to do either like a work placement where you're working under someone and learning from them, mm. or it comes down to you know set up a server in a VM or something, decide on a task you want to accomplish, and hack on it until you do, and then you know keep notes while you're doing it, and then delete it and do it a second time. And if you do it the second time in a reasonable amount of time, then you've learned it. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think you've nailed that. That's down. the biggest one. Is like you, you know, experimenting and getting it set up is great. But if you can't then immediately delete it and set it up again, then you haven't learned it right. I feel like um I, I, the answer the you know, he started out, is he too old? I don't think it's so much well, a matter of age. The, the best answer to that question is take a look at that picture from the FreeBSD Developer Summit. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the average age is like 45. See, Alan, there, there it, are a bunch of people in there that are over 50. Yeah, I mean, if I'm going by some of these gray beards, uh, I'd say yeah. he's not too young. And there, I think what there, it, are, what you there gotta, are very few people in their 20s in that picture. You've got to remember <laughs> that because the technology field itself is always changing, there's not necessarily a, disadva- a disadvantage of when you get in or when you get out. It's more about how fast you get in and you get it up to speed. You know, you get your skill set, your, you, Maybe you get somewhere where you get some practical experience. I always prefer practical experience. The one thing is it's yep. like it's really easy to say, yeah, go to college, take these courses, l- study these things. I can't just say go to this workplace, volunteer there for the summer, get some practical work experience on your resume because that's going to be unique for each person where well, you have that, that opportunity. All of that, that's unique. That, depending on the schools, some of the, you can get that. Like uh, the college where I taught, they had a co-op program where – you would uh, go to school for two semesters, and then you would spend a semester in a work placement that's uh, part of your college grade. Uh, so the college helps, you know, a list of companies that are willing to take a student come to the college and, and uh, you know, interview the students and pick one. And then uh, the company pays you to work for them, although the government gives them a, a subsidy to, you know, a tax break on a fraction of your salary. But uh, And then you have to write a... a a write up at the end of it, and they, you know, they come out to the workplace and check on you every once in a while, mm. and and it's it's called cooperative education. So, and first of all, it helps you pay for college, and second of all, it means that when you graduate, you have two or three four month blocks of experience actually working at real companies, and they're usually big companies. Like here, it's like you know banks and and uh, like government offices and and all kinds of companies where you actually have really valuable work experience. And you probably also, with that, you get to see a couple of different environments. Like you'll find one that's, you know, we're still using, uh, you know, Windows Server 2003 or something and one that's using the newest something and one that's all VMware and one that's not and so on. Also, the industries you go <clears throat> after will dictate sort of what their expectations are for a new recruit. Like uh, some fields, it's sort of the culture of that field to be very dependent on certifications. So for you to go in, they need to see a certain set of uh, acronyms on your resume, or they're not going to be particularly interested right. in, you know, in. If you. they're a VMware shop, they they would love it if you had a bunch of VMware certs. Yeah, uh, but if they're not, they're not going to give a shit about your VMware certs. No, you know, I give. There's a there is a, over over here. There is a local a solar panel manufacturing plant. And uh, they don't really care at all about the certifications, right? But then just across the street, there is a place that makes airplane parts for Boeing. And they care a hell of a lot about what certifications you have. So also keep in mind what you think, where, what field and area of the technology industry you're likely to end up in. And that'll yeah. kind of dictate what you should sort of tailor your resume to and just look at it from that perspective, don't you think? Yeah, that, that's one of the other things is just when you're writing your resume, you probably need almost a different resume for each different company yeah. based on what kind of things they're doing. Yeah. You know, like when I was teaching, I had a completely different resume than the one I did when I was, you know, applying to do like PHP web development stuff versus what I was doing sysadmin stuff. Um, but yeah, it comes down to, you know, some of the businesses is like, we don't care what search you have and stuff because what we do is unique to us. So we're going to have to teach you everything anyway. Yeah. There's, there's no one that already knows how to use our system because if, if they did, they would already work here. Right. Or they, they already work here because yeah. that's the only way our to learn Our system is our unique system. to us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so sometimes it just comes down to, you know, are you going to fit into their culture properly? Mm-hmm. All right. Next email comes in from Ryan, and uh, he's, he's somehow picked up on our appreciation of Bacula. He says, hey, Chris and Alan, yep. from early episodes until now, you've both spoken very highly of Bacula. And with that, I've decided to give it a trial run in my lab with hopes of replacing it. Uh, in, with our current backup solution. My request for you is to help me understand the retention policies and destination storage requirements. I've read from their online guides that data will, re- data will be retained until all three policies have expired. Files, volume, and job. If the job retention policy is set to six months, which is the default, then my destination hard drives used by the Bacula fill up without recycling the volumes until the backups start to fail at the start of the next month. Do I need to have at least double the storage space for full, true backups? 
My fear is that the source of data disappears during a monthly full backup job that I'll have an incomplete full backup if it was recycling the volumes from previous full backups. Is my logic correct? I hope this makes sense to you guys. Supporting info, in the lab I have two 2.2 terabyte of source data that he's backing up. The back of the destination is a four terabyte hard drive. It seems I only have room for a single full backup, a weekly differential, and the daily incrementals. Any help understanding this would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I want to be fully prepared for the for, before I present this solution to management where we'll need to back up over 1.7 petabytes. Okay, there's a couple different things. A, first of all, uh, you should look at back of this compression because uh, then you could save uh, a bunch and of the he space. He also didn't mention how much data is changing every day or every week. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, with 2.2 terabytes and only 4 terabytes of destination, you might actually run into some stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also depends what your destination is. If it's ZFS, you might turn off compression in Bacula and turn it on in the uh, on ZFS instead. But um, the advantage to doing the, z the compression in Bacula is it compresses it before it sends it over the network. Ah. So uh, it can, you know, if you're maxing out your gigabit network uh, backing up stuff, compression means that you'll get more effective transfer. Um, so yeah, generally the way the backup retention policy works is that you'll have multiple full backups and then, you know, when it needs more, it'll erase the oldest one. Uh, but if you don't have enough room for multiple full backups, then you start to run into trouble. Um, and normally, yeah, I, I, my normal policy was like a, a full backup every month keeping, I had five or six full volumes uh, with the retention policy of keeping three. So what that meant was that it would never erase the three newest ones, uh, but it would actually keep more than that and then overwrite them only if it needed to. Nice. Um, but eventually, yeah, obviously you have to have enough space to do that. Uh, there are also... The, the back of the retention stuff can be a little confusing when you have to consider that there's the actual volumes where the files are stored and they have a retention policy. And then separately, there's the indexing. There's an SQL database that can be on MySQL or Postgres or whatever that actually has an index of like every file in it. And that is really helpful for speeding up, you know, which volume has the latest version of this file so I can restore it. Very much. But it, you don't, if you lose those or if you just have a retention policy that says get rid of that eventually, because you know the SQL database is only I only have room for so many million rows in my database or whatever. Uh, you can still the files are still in the backup and you can still restore them. It's just you would have to manually figure out which weekly has the most recent copy of this file in it or whatever. Whereas the SQL index makes you find that out really really quickly. Um, so yeah, if you have 2.2 terabytes of source data and only four terabytes of backup storage, it's really hard to have two full backups. Mm -hmm. uh, but enabling the compression might make enough of a difference that you could actually be able to do that. Depends on what he's backing up. I I, yeah. I wonder. I mean, with geez, we're talking about petabytes worth of data. You wonder how compressible it maybe it is. Yeah. Well, he's, in his his example one, it's 2.2 terabytes. But yeah, when he yes, gets to yes. petabytes, then yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bacula has a couple things. Um, there's the thing called a virtual full backup, where it can take the last full backup and like the most recent two differentials. And recombine those into a new full backup without actually taking a full backup. I love that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing it has is deduplication uh, in a different way than most. What you can do is you create what's called a base backup. If you, say, have 100 FreeBSD servers that are mostly the same, you create a base FreeBSD backup where it backs up just the files that are the same on all of those servers. Right? And it stores that once. You know, you have a full backup of that every month or whatever. And then each server has its regular backup that excludes all the files that are in the base. So only if a file changes from the base uh, is it get backed up on each machine. So that basically allows you to, you know, if you have Windows servers, you probably have a lot of the same, you know, the Windows system files, all the DLLs, everything in the Windows directory probably is pretty much the same on all those machines except for like the registry. And so you can create a base backup that's the same for all of those and save yourself a huge amount of backup space. Uh, so yeah, compression, deduplication, and uh, yeah. The docs for Bacula are pretty good. Uh, sadly, Dan has run off from the chat room, but he knows more about <laughs> Bacula than anybody I know. He's actually uh, maintains the Bacula port for FreeBSD. Oh. Yeah, he's uh, a huge lover of the Bacula. He actually yeah. teaches courses on it. Uh, I think it's the best. I think it's the best network backup solution I've ever used myself. Yes, uh, especially if you have to deal with a lot of data. Yeah, or a lot of machines. And Even if it's not a lot of data; if it's a lot of machines. That's where Bacula really excels over a lot of other solutions. I have. I'm comparing it to some of the largest enterprise-grade 
backup systems. I'm talking about like the backup systems where if you think you're going to buy it, they fly out salespeople and engineers and they take you out to a multi-day lunch experience and they wine and dine you and convince you why you want their backup solution. Like I'm talking comparing to like backup solutions where they really go all out and back it up for me. You know, especially in the age of hard drives, where you can just get so much backup done with hard drives and then write off to tapes and then write off, you know, so you can have warm and cold. It's just, it's the best system out there. Give it a go. If you yeah. guys haven't noticed, we're fans. All right, yes. we got we got a VLAN question. And, ah, yes, uh, this is a good one. <clears throat> this one came in from viewer Chris. He says, great show, guys. Uh, it really makes my compu- commute bearable. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So I guess he's listener Chris, actually. Uh, he says, I'm trying to improve my knowledge and skills by trying stuff on my home network, which drives my wife crazy when I break stuff. Boy, I've been there, man. Uh, since we often have babysitters and guests at the house, this guy's like right up my alley. This is my world. I've decided that one of my learning projects would be to set up a guest WAP to provide internet only access separate from my NAS and other things on my private network. So I've got a Netgear GS724T smart switch as one of the core of my network universe. I've created VLAN 1 as a private VLAN. It's a 192.168.2 network slash 24 and vlan 10 as my public vlan which is a 10.0.10.0 slash 24 now he's not exactly like my house and he actually used the exact same switch that i have at my house oh nice the netgear gs 724t now he's no slouch he's also got a pfsense appliance as his router firewall with two interfaces so he created virtual op 2 interface on vlan 10 on the physical lan interface on the pfsense box so he's got a virtual nic in vlan 10 after a lot of trial and error with tagging and untagging my ports i have this setup working perfectly my problem is I don't know why it works. You guys are great at explaining a lot of these technical concepts, so they are digestible by someone like me. I was hoping you could explain tagging. He says, uh, the setup that works is as follows. Switch port 13 is in the guest WAP. Untagged VLAN 10 guest, not a member not a member of VLAN 1. All other ports on the switch, untagged VLAN 1, members of VLAN 1. Switch port 18, that's the PFSS interface. It's untagged VLAN 1 private, tagged VLAN 10 guest. Thanks yep. for all your great work. And that's Sully Bear in IRC. Yes. Uh, So to understand how this works, I guess you have to understand that uh, the switch deals with VLANs in two different ways. Uh, And so, so when when if you're a member of the VLAN, that deals with when the packets come in. Uh, And well, there's the member of the VLAN. There's also another option which is called the port VLAN ID, which is uh, the VLAN that gets assigned to an incoming packet uh, when it comes in. So I guess. To start, I guess I have to explain how VLANs work. So, you know, normally when you uh, have a network, you have the Ethernet frames that go across the network, right? And when the switch gets like a broadcast type one, it sends it out every port. So, in the Ethernet header on the front of the packet, uh, there's a slot for a VLAN, which is normally empty. But if you put a number in there, that means this packet is for this virtual LAN. All right, and that's called tagging. Uh, so, normally what happens is if you're uh, a member, so when a packet comes in, it can either be tagged or untagged, and that'll be determined by the machine that sent it. And most machines, since they don't have any VLANs configured, have untagged packets. Uh, so when they get to the switch, the switch looks at it and sees if it has a tag or not. Uh, and it also looks in its configuration, and you have these, what are called port VLAN ID. Uh, and what that does is, if the packet comes in and doesn't have a tag, assign this tag to it, right? It basically sets the, the default, default tag. Uh, and then the member, whether you're a member of VLAN or not, determines whether the packets are allowed to cross between the ports. Right? So if I send a broadcast message and my port is set to be on VLAN 10 and it's not a member of VLAN 1, then the people in VLAN 1 won't get a copy of that packet. Right? It'll isolate the network like you want. Uh, but the important one is that choosing the tagging or untagging. What that does is when the packet leaves the switch, the switch decides whether to put the tag on it or not. Uh, right? So, for example, he says his switch that has the wireless access point on it is set to be untagged. Uh, VLAN 10 is set to be untagged. So what that means is when a packet that's in VLAN 10 leaves the switch on port 13, the switch takes the VLAN tag off so that the packet doesn't have a tag because the access point does, isn't set up for VLAN, so it doesn't know what they are or it doesn't know about VLAN 10. So if it gets a packet for VLAN 10, it's like, I'm not in VLAN 10, I'll ignore that. So it never gets the packet. But if you take it off, then now it gets the packet. And so then it works. And then he doesn't mention it here, but he will have the uh, VLAN ID of port 13 set to 10. So when a packet comes from the wireless access point that doesn't know about VLANs, it gets tagged with 10. So that then when it goes 
it, it only gets sent to machines that are also in VLAN 10. And then you see on his uh, PFSense, he has it set to be tagged uh, for VLAN 10. Mm -hmm. So it means when the packet comes in, so it, the packet leaves the wireless router, doesn't have a tag, arrives at the switch, the port VLAN ID sets the tag to 10, uh, the PFSense is in VLAN 10, so it's allowed to get the packet, and then uh, the tag, when it leaves port uh, 18 to, to go to the PFSense, because it's set to be tagged, it leaves the tag on the packet. So now when the PFSense gets it, the packet arrives on that opt2 interface instead of the regular LAN interface. Right? Because it has the tag, it shows up on the different interface in PFSense and gets routed differently. Right. Uh, then for, he said for VLAN 1, he had it untagged. Because he doesn't have a VLAN 1 device configured on his PFSense, he had to make it untagged so the packet would arrive at the, the PFSense with no tag on it. He could also have left that tag and just switch his configuration on the PFSense and have no configuration on the, uh, the actual interface and set up a second, like an OPT3 that was set up in VLAN 1. So I, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. That's a great explanation. <clears throat> yeah. So basically the switch is able to deal with devices that don't understand VLANs and still put them in a VLAN. And basically the switch deals with, on incoming traffic, it decides if it should tag a packet or not based on the port VLAN ID, uh, and the fact of, does this packet already have a tag on it? And then you also, then when it leaves, it decides whether it should remove the tag or not so that it can support devices that don't understand what VLANs are. Mm -hmm. Separately, you'll also have uh, the ingress control. You can say, uh, you know, on this VLAN, only the ports that are members of it are allowed to send packets into this VLAN. So you can stop somebody that's on, say, your guest VLAN from being able to send a packet that's on VLAN 10. Or, or sorry, on VLAN one, so they can talk to a machine they're not supposed to be able to talk to. Yes, the the documentation on this is kind of hard to understand <laughs> in the beginning. It took me a while, and uh, breaking a production network uh, before I understood how it worked. And the fact that you know it's not any one setting that makes it work. You have to have the the membership in the VLANs, the port VLAN ID, and the tagging set up correctly, plus the configuration on the devices. Yeah, yeah. It's a great. It's a. It's just a great ability though to essentially achieve land separation without having to actually have yep. physical land separation. And yeah, uh, exactly. It's great. Like uh, a lot of places will do. Our phones are in one VLAN. Our printers are in one VLAN, and our yeah, desktops well, are in another. In fact, actually, the um, the Netgear supports an automatic VoIP VLAN. Oh yeah. Where it knows the MAC addresses of of cell phones of uh, of common of IP phones. phones. Yeah. 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 So what it, th that way, you know, for example, there's a switch cool. port. There's, you know, port number 13 in my basement comes up to a jack in, my, in my, this computer room here, which is then broken out with a, a five-port switch to connect to multiple devices. Uh, so that way, if I plug a phone in here, the phone will end in the VLAN, but my PC won't. And you don't have to, like, go into the switch and set it every time you move it either, well, right? But yeah, uh, the, there's that. It allows them to roam around. That's nice. Uh, especially if you have wireless. That's nice because staff move stuff around at their desks all yeah. the time. But mostly it's, it's also because, you know, there might be more than one device sharing that port, and you want to be more specific than that. Uh, the higher-end version of that switch and a lot of other switches, like the GS72, 24T, which yeah. is layer two. Yeah. Uh, it's a smarter switch. It costs about three times as much. Uh, the GS seven two four T is about two hundred dollars, and the advanced one that actually does layer three stuff is like I think eight hundred dollars. Uh, it can do automatic VLANs based on the subnet, where it would just see if you if the traffic is one nine two one six eight, put it in nice. VLAN one, and if it's ten o ten, put it in VLAN ten. That's slick. Yeah. Although that makes it easier for someone to just jump and be in a VLAN, right? Mm. By just manually setting their IP to be in that subnet. Yes, very much so. Uh, all right. But all right. depending on your setup, it might be the way you want it to be done. Are you ready for our next email, Mr. Jude? Yep. Okay, this one, this one's a bit long, so I'm going to try to summarize. It comes in from Kenny, and he's got an idea about virtualization as a solution for his business. Um, he's got uh, a work setup that kind of goes like this. Windows Server, he's got six PCs running Windows 7 Pro and two five-year-old PCs running Windows XP. 
One of them is his, too, which is the worst part. The two XP machines will shortly be replaced as they're currently almost unusable, not to mention insecure. They're going to be replaced by Intel i7 machines with 8 gigabytes of RAM and SSD drives. Here's the problem. About a year ago, unsatisfied with our IT support, we switched to a new, fresh-looking local company. Things have not improved. My, X machine, my XP machine, which rocks, a Pentium Core Duo at 3 gigahertz, grinds to a halt for up to a minute at a time due to extra weight of antivirus software and other recently added security software. The Windows 7 machines behave better, but then they don't handle such heavy workloads very well either. So he had an idea based on our discussions around virtualization as of late. He wants to run a variety of Windows-only specialist software, such as AutoCAD 2014 and a networked version of Sage. He also has a network Konica scanner printer. All of these processes, other than the actual connection to the server, I presume, would be handled by a virtual machine on top of a Linux box, he says. And what about this, Alan? He says, I, I, uh, I need a couple of Windows applications, but I'm sick and tired of playing the Windows upgrade game. He said, I ran a low-level test case using an old Sony VAIO laptop and Ubuntu 14.04, and it worked quite well, considering that I could only give virtual machine 512 megabytes of RAM and 32 megabytes of graphic with no 3D capabilities but it wasn't one of our networked machines that maybe multiple users could end up remoting into. So could it work? And he says, many thanks for the great shows. Um, yes and no. You know, if your problem is performance, um, virtualizing it probably just going to make it worse. Yeah, I mean, as much as I'd love um, to say, yeah, put Windows in a VM and use Linux, I don't think this is a good idea, Kenny. It, it depends. Uh, he didn't really mention what the newer machines were. Uh, well, i7s. Uh, if with they have, well, if they have, uh, yeah, if they have the virtualization offload yeah. stuff, then the CPU performance won't really be that big of a hit in the virtual yeah. machine. Yeah. But your disk performance will. So if you're still running the virus scanner in the virtual machine, then obviously you're going to have. I think he was same, planning not like, to, what, and utilizing more like snapshots and things like that if things yeah, go wrong. Snapshots don't necessarily stop you from getting a virus though yeah, and that yeah. It, letting it spread and so on <laughs> yeah yeah or that because even if it just so, ran for a day or two with the virus that could do enough damage yeah uh so in general virtualization is helpful but not always uh depending on the setup you used it can give you the advantage of being able to shuffle things around It'd be portable. Uh, you know yeah so basically you know you have these four four of these machines are doing work where they're not busy all the time mm-hmm I can consolidate using virtualization and consolidate all four of those on one machine, and now it's moderately busy. And that leaves me more machines that I can actually be splitting the busy work up between. Uh, but, you know, depending on your application, that doesn't always work either. Um, but yeah, uh, virus scanners slow you down. That's why most people don't install them on their server. And that's not necessarily a good thing either. But Okay, Alan. All right, there's our answer. We got a lot of emails, and I only included one of them about the whole DevOps discussion we've had over the last couple of weeks. Surf wrote like said, in. Here's, here's my first thing about DevOps. Okay. It's, problem is, it's a buzzword, and so it means different things to I know. different people. Yes, exactly. Now, hold on. Before we go down that route, because uh, we're going to yeah. address that too, okay. Surf writes in. He says, hi, guys. I'd like to add a few comments to your DevOps discussion from the podcast I listen to. DevOps is more of a culture and less of a title. You can still have a traditional developer and sysadmins participating in DevOps organization. DevOps promotes collaboration, automation, and continuous delivery. It's a response to the silos that have developed in more traditional IT organizations where dev, QA, and ops are separate organizations with mandates that they can often be in conflict with each other. In the traditional IT world, many processes have e are executed manually. DevOps attempts to automate this work, replacing it with fast delivery pipelines. So uh, a couple other people recommended we look at DevOps, the definition on Wikipedia, and here's just the Wikipedia. Yes. So the problem is that Wikipedia definition is fine, and that kind of DevOps is good, but that's not right. the kind most people are talking about when they say DevOps. Right. The Wikipedia DevOps is a software development method that stresses communication, collaboration, and integration between software developers and yes. information professionals. And it sounds more like marketing mumbo jumbo. The DevOps uh, in general, but what, what it what it means in that case, in their definition of DevOps, is instead of you know having an IT department or like a like a server operations group. Uh, a software development group and a QA group and you know when the developers have to develop stuff on their hard drive and then uh, are on their own computer and then when they go to deploy it on the server the environment's different and they're like ah this doesn't work because this environment's different and with a DevOps type thing then the operations guys would be providing the developers with VMs that are basically a clone of exactly what yeah. the development environment's going to be and when Docker that changes they like update that, that mm -hmm. and yeah and, and magic happens uh, and yes, that's all well and good. The problem is that 
DevOps has become a job title when you're one guy doing all three of those jobs. That's the part we don't like. And you're not good at any of them. Preach it, Alan. <laughs> Preach it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, DevOps, uh, the whole collab between sysadmins and developers and, and you know, yes, continuous. Uh, like, I understand. You, there was always this contention where, you know, the server guys and the software guys and they'd never get along and, yeah. you know, you'd have to ask for something and wait a week for it to happen. Uh, and you'd end up you end up with the software guys just setting up their own server to test stuff on, and then it would be different and broken and vulnerable. And you know the the ops guys are mad because you set up a server running you know this different Linux that they're not right. set up for managing. They're and running just, CentOS. You deployed Ubuntu. <laughs> yeah, and all this stuff, and and then and then you're mad at them because you you know this app works perfectly on our software on our Ubuntu server, and we play it on CentOS. It doesn't work because right. it doesn't have you know PHP five dot next or whatever. Uh, and so, yes, I understand the concept of DevOps in the, you know, work, may, those different groups working together and being more agile is good. The problem is that it's become a job description instead. And, and you know. vague. Yeah. It, when, it's, when it's the software guy setting up the server, that was the whole point of DevOps was to avoid the software guy setting up his own server. Yeah. And, and that seems to be getting lost sometimes in this hyper buzzword. Because, yes, DevOps as to find on Wikipedia, other than the fact that it's full of buzzwords and cliches, uh, is a good thing. And so everybody thinks it's a good thing when somebody claims something is DevOps when it's actually the thing DevOps was designed to prevent, which is software people that don't know what they're doing setting up servers. And essentially creating single points of failure, silos in their own rights, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, just yeah. unmaintainability and stuff. And, you know, just because you can deploy something instantly doesn't mean that you're maintaining it properly. Especially, it can end up being <laughs> that your solution every time is just throw it away and make a new one. Oh. Which can be useful, but, you know, there's problems with that, too. Yes. All right. Well, T to the Z, VI writes in, and he says, hey, guys, love the show. Been watching since the first episode. Can you please talk about load balancing? I watched Alan's talk about their GSLB load balancing solution at EuroBSDCon 2012. Yep. Maybe you guys can briefly go over the different options that are out there and maybe expand on some of them. Thanks. So, Alan, you got any? Okay. Quick- a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, I really wish the video from 2013 would come out because I expanded on some of that stuff and how to use it to do denial of service mitigation. Uh-huh. But anyway, uh-huh. uh, load balancing comes down to you can load balance at each different layer in the OSI stack. So with layer two load balancing, that's when you have something, uh, well, I guess layer three load balancing is something like CARP where you're actually sharing the same IP address between a bunch of machines and using that to load balance. Uh, so, you know, the application on the end might not even be aware of it, but you're actually just splitting up traffic between servers based on, on like, at the IP level. Um, and then you can have stuff more like application layer load balancing where, you know, something like a hardware load balancer or an Nginx where requests for a website comes into this machine and then it decides, hey, I'm going to send some of the packets over here or some of the packets over there. Or, you know, this request is going to this back end and this request is going to that back end. Or, you know, that back end's down, so I'm not going to use it. Things like that. Uh, and, you know, uh, for example, the GSLB talk is all about using, uh, putting your load balancer at, at the DNS layer so that when a person looks up, you know, when they want to download a file from, from Jupyter Broadcasting, uh, instead of load balancing just being, here's a list of servers, pick one kind of thing, uh, it looks at, where's this user coming from? Oh, they're in Europe, so let's send them to our servers in Germany. Uh, and then it looks at all of our servers in Germany and it's like, which one of these isn't maxing out its network card already? Ah, that one. So we turn that one. Uh, but you can also do that in a more macro. Uh, we do it that way because our servers are spread out. If we had all of our servers in one rack, then we'd be doing something more like, you know, the packet comes into the front end system and it decides, hey, read it to this guy and he'll answer it. Right? And so you get different styles depending on what you're doing. It can also depend on whether your application handles it, right? Uh, you know, certain types of load balancing. Uh, for example, sometimes you have this problem that's called sticky. Um, if you have sessions in your web, say, uh, for example, you're running a newspaper website and people can log in and, you know, they put in their postal code or their zip code or whatever so they get the local weather forecast when they're reading the national news site or whatever. Uh, in order for that to work, you have that cookie or that login session has to stick as they move around with the load balancer. Uh, so some of them will have what's called a sticky back end where, you know, it uses uh, math, a hash algorithm to decide, you know, divide all the users that come up into six different buckets and send one bucket of those to each server. So the same person always ends up at the same server so that their, their session data is there and it's fine, Right. 
or you can set it up so that people just get distributed randomly and all four of your back ends somewhere have like a shared storage where they all have access to that session data. Although then you have to worry about locking and some other stuff. So, it, you know, there's a lot of things to come down to your load balancing question. And it might be easier if you told us what you're trying to load balance. <laughs> oh, for uh, sure. Because it's always going to depend. Always. Yeah. Uh, there's a great app called RelayD uh, for OpenBSD and FreeBSD. Yeah. Uh, that's basically an application level load balancer. So Nginx is great for load balancing HTTP and HTTPS, uh, but it doesn't really do other protocols where RelayD does. Uh, and it has also this, uh, when you're doing load balancing with HTTP, you have to, uh, because the user connects to the load balancer and then the load balancer connects to the back end, the back end only ever sees the load balancer IP. So the hack for that was that they just uh, inject an extra header in the HTTP request saying, hey, the person who's connecting, the real IP is this. The load balancer would inject that so the back end would know the actual IP of the user so that every request isn't just seen as coming from the load balancer because that messes up like your, uh, your HTTP logs and like your stats and, and login restrictions, whatever you're trying to do, right? Like if you're going to try to blacklist an IP if it fails to log in 10 times, well, if you blacklist the load balancer, now nobody can log in. Um, but that only really works for HTTP, right? FTP doesn't have something like that, or mm. uh, every other protocol doesn't. Right. So uh, RelayD actually has the ability to spoof the from address uh, because it's running as root, uh, so that the back end actually sees the connection is coming from the IP even though it went through the load balancer. And then when the reply goes out, it doesn't have to go through the load balancer. It can actually go out via the router instead, uh, which also means that, you know, if your load, if your if your amount of incoming traffic is if your amount of traffic is in the gigabits range, yeah, it means all the requests are probably not adding up to that much traffic. They can go through one pair of load balancers that can only handle a gigabit per second, and all the responses, which is the big part of HTTP, right, is going to go out around the load balancer, not loading it up. Meaning that you can actually be able to generate gigabits of outbound traffic, uh, even though your load balancer can only handle one gigabit of incoming. Uh, so relay data is really good and can work for basically any protocol. Uh, and it can also be used on the outbound leg to do stuff like um, uh, intercepting SSL to block certain stuff or to upgrade the encryption to uh, for perfect forward secrecy. Uh, also, they registered the coolest domain name ever. Uh, BSD.plumbing is uh, just a copy of the man page, but it's a funny website. That's very awesome. That's very awesome. I got a really cool URL uh, I'm going to tell you about here in a minute, but I first... Uh, I'll cover our last email before I get to that because it came from our buddy Ninja Aaron. You remember Ninja Aaron last yep. week? He's got the job because he found the uh, like the terminal on that machine. Well, so he was going in for that big security interview. Uh, and by the way, the company he's working for, he doesn't quite want to say. He'll he'll just say this. It's the world's third largest fashion retailer after uh, H&M, and it's named after something you might fall into. Which I'm trying to think of what that would be. I'm not a big shopper, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. If there's a clothing line called Hole in the Ground. <laughs> so he says, anyways, I didn't end up getting uh, the job. I guess they figured right. being enthusiastic about Linux and even Arch no less wasn't enough to make me responsible for the security of an enormous international corporation that deals with millions of people's financial information every year. Weird, huh? However, they did offer me some sort of mentorship type thing to help me learn more of the kind of skills needed for an IT job. Of course, their tech guys have nothing better to do than help me learn trade skills, right? And it comes down to making their boss happy or taking the time to show me a few tricks. They'll definitely go for that. You'll forgive I me if I'm skeptic. I necessarily assume that. Sometimes he seems a little you skeptic. Just get them excited. Right, but sometimes they just get excited about it and they will... Yeah, and if you uh, ask the right excellent. questions and they think you've got potential, they'll, they'll double yeah, down. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was teaching, I always really liked it when I found a student that was actually interested in the stuff and wanted to go further than what yeah. was in the material. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, fine. Uh, and, and, you know, I always had to make sure I didn't, didn't spend yeah. all my time with that person and not teach the rest of the class the basics. Uh, you know, uh, oh, but, the chat room's the chat room's figured it out. The chat room, I think the chat room has nailed down which retail outlet it is. Uh, you know, the other thing, too, I will say, uh, Ninja Aaron, is now you don't have to worry, like, are they going to find out I'm a fraud? Oh my gosh, I have to go in tomorrow and I have to do the security audit. They're going to find out I'm a fraud. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You, you still got a little hookup. They appreciate the solid effort. Way. Huh? I feel a little bit that way myself because I'm I'm running in the FreeBSD core team election. That's crazy. Awesome, Alan. <laughs> I'm like, all these people, they're like, they think I'm awesome. I'm like, I had to write in my little statements like, I don't know how to program in C, <laughs> like at all, even a little bit. No. 
<laughs> just make sure you realize this before yeah. you vote for me. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's a boy. That's big, though. You have to let us know how that goes because that could be big. Uh, so there are 21 people running for nine seats, and the election will end a month from now. Wow. You got to wait a month? Yeah. If people get a month to vote. They can start voting now, uh, and they can change the vote up until the 28th, and then it'll close, and they'll tally the finals. Well, speaking of feeling like a fraud, I have a feeling I could be about to fall flat on my face and then, like, grind it into the pavement kind of fall. Like a real bad fall. Because on Monday, I'm launching a brand new show called Tech Talk Today, a daily show Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, over at jblive.tv. Brand new show. Brand new show. Brand new show over at jupiterbroadcasting.com every single day. We're going to have an open mumble room for some of the show, too, so that way you guys can talk back. It'll be kind of a talk show where I'll talk about uh, a tech item of the day or anything else I feel like. Or I got a few other surprises that uh, we'll go into more details when we launch the show. So that starts on Monday. I don't even know if that's going to be possible. It's crazy. That's that's nuts. It's a little on the crazy side. Yeah. Tech Talk Today starting on Monday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Oh, my gosh. Daily show. Daily show. It's been a while since you have one of those. Well, I told myself I would never do it again. And if I ever did it again, I'd have to be prepared for a lifestyle change. Yeah, and uh, when you were doing that, it was, you know, a couple steps from your bedroom, not yeah, um, yeah. across town. Right, about 20 minutes from my house. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, there you go. 9 a.m., That's. Early. I guess you have to get up that early anyway. Yeah, you know. You never get to sleep that late. No, I mean, you know, eventually. I'm spoiled. I sleep till like 10 o'clock. I mean, 7, 7.30 is, it feels pretty good. Like, if that happens, that's right. a pretty. And even then, if I could still make it over here in time. But, yeah, daily show, Tech Talk today, and I hope you guys will join me. There's things that will just come up that are, are just going to be great for conversations. But there's also a few like uh, fun things that I have in store that I'll tell you guys more about yeah. over the Plus, first few episodes. Like you talked about just uh, you know talking about what's coming up on the shows or what just yep. happened on the shows. Yeah, it'll be a great uh, source. Like you can tune in, you'll find out like, hey, the BSD Now guys just did X Y Z or TechSnap covered the whole true right, situation. I a lot of the Linux people don't watch BSD Now every week, but if there's a week when we're doing something. You know, you that go. they might be interested in, they yeah. can check it out. Plus, I'm going to uh, have we a. We just did a great tutorial on DNS crypt. Oh, is that on this week's DNS. episode? Yep. And that, uh, the instructions for that are basically exactly the same on every OS. Well, guess what just came out while we were doing this here show, episode 39, The Friendly mm-hmm. Sandbox. Oh, yes. And it's about uh, Capsicum, which is being ported to Linux by Google. So if you're interested in security sandboxing and capabilities, you should check out our interview with John Anderson. Now, one of these days, Alan, because what I want to have is a rotating cast of characters on Tech Talk today. One of these days, I don't know what you're doing around noon Eastern, but the it'd phone might... Huh? It'd be 1 Eastern, right? 9, 9 a.m. Pacific? Oh. No, that'd be noon. Never mind. Yeah. Um, you might hear yeah. a ring ring. Hey, Alan, are you busy? <laughs> you want to come on a show with me, Alan? I, I know it's noon there. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be... I'll probably be eating lunch. But yeah, I know. But, well, excuse me, what? I want you to we'll, what? Or, we'll organize it a little bit ahead of time <laughs> yeah. so that I can. Uh, yeah, I want to have I want to have you on there. I want to have uh, Ange on there. I want to have Chase on. I want to have the whole rotating cast. Monday, uh, Popey from Linux Unplugged and uh, awesome. the uh, and and a few other uh, popular internet shows, which I'm blanking on the name. You of You wouldn't right think now. so, but uh, you know, he's one of my favorite Linux people. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He's a great well, conversation because he's you know logical and says things that make sense <laughs> instead of. Ben Boyd, like some of you Linux people. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. All right, well, that wraps us up for the TechSnap feedbacks. You know what that means? It's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them and give you some links to read up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Alan, I'm so excited because in Q3, I'm finally going to get TV service here at the JB1 Studios because Dish Network has announced they're accepting Bitcoin for payment for Dish TV service. That's gimmicky, but I suppose. It's huge, and if you ask me. It seems to me that people that use bitcoins are the type of people that generally don't watch tv a lot maybe so maybe so but then again you got some extra coinage to spare and you you know weren't traditionally going to spend all that much money on tv service now you can and this dish is now the largest company i believe to accept bitcoin as well the i guess dish maybe makes sense more than cable because what's the point of bitcoins of using bitcoins to buy stuff if you have to tell them where you live (laughs) 
Well, I think it, you know, I think there's just a category of people now that just have a lot of funding in bitcoins. Right. Uh, and And I think the tax but, yeah, if you the, don't have to take them I think if you don't take them out of bitcoin, I think the tax situation is different too. So if you can spend them as Bitcoin, there's some maybe some tax incentive there too. Maybe. Uh, all right, Alan. Now, uh, our subreddit loves anything with the word postmortem. In fact, I put a link in the subreddit that just said postmortem and not much more, and it's still got a bunch of upvotes. We've got one from Joynet here, don't we? Yeah, uh, Joynet uh, Joint. had one, uh, would have been Tuesday, uh, where a data center op guy accidentally rebooted every server in their <laughs> U.S. East 1 data center. Oh, oh ouch. Yeah. Uh, and they all came back up and their system kind of performed like it was supposed to, uh, except for a couple of things. A firmware bug in, they didn't say, but, they, but it was Broadcom network cards, uh, means that when they pixie boot, there's about a 10% chance it won't get the DHCP lease properly, requiring that machine to be rebooted again. Uh, and they had to manually find those machines and stuff. Uh, and also that they're, um, they have a, a N plus 2 setup for their backplane. Uh, that with the API that handles all the machines and configuring them, but because all three rebooted at once, they lost all the state and the servers came back up in a split brain thing. So each one thought it was the master because it was the first one back up and it hadn't established communication with the other. And enough stuff happened that they couldn't synchronize, and so it required human intervention. And so they had to go through all of what happened. Uh, and basically, they talked about some changes they're going to try to make so that the um, you know. First of all, some input validation being like, you know, are you sure you want to reboot every server in the data center? Because uh, it sounds like what happened is, I imagine it's based on like a filter or a like SQL query or something to decide which server to reboot. And have you ever done been doing an SQL query and been like, blah, 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 where this and this and accidentally run it before you add the next and that actually does something? An embarrassingly high amount of times I've done that. Yeah, yes. or uh, actually my friend Phil was doing an update on customer records to fix something about them. Yeah. Uh, to like change a flag or something. Yeah. Oh no, sorry. He was working on the code and he was testing it. Yeah. And uh, so he was editing somebody's address and yeah. because of a typo, the entire where clause was missing. <laughs> so he changed the address for all 20,000 uh, all 20,000 <laughs> customers to the one new address. So everybody lived at the same place. Ooh. Uh, and you know, little things like that. And so something like that happened and it rebooted every single server. So they're talking about, you know, maybe not having tools that can do the smaller stuff without, you know, giving everybody the tool that can cut their leg off. Right. You know, may, not everything requires a power tool <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. And just more input validation to be like, are you sure? So that when you accidentally hit enter there instead of backslash or pipe and it starts running and it stops and says, hey, this is going to affect more than five servers. Are you sure you want to do this? Remember that story we had about the Windows uh, network that yep. deployed the yes, installation exactly. image? Rate limiting and stuff. Yeah. Well, because that was the other thing is that Joint had some rate limiting in place uh, for the boot up, and that was making things take longer. And so they'd actually take it off to let all the machines come back up quickly enough. And then complicated by the buggy Broadcom firmware that meant that some of the machines wouldn't pixie boot properly. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, it's a great uh, postmortem, and they get into some of the details and what went wrong and uh, clarify the point that a bunch of people had the question of, did you fire the guy? And they said, no. Uh, you know, it's partly not his fault. It was the tool that let him do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he obviously learned it will never do that one again and things hmm. like that. Well, uh, so speaking of digging through the data, Google has released uh, their diversity report on their official Google blog. Nothing too surprising here. Um, 70% men, 30% women, 61% white, 30% Asian at Google, 3% Hispanic, 2% black. Uh, the one thing that was really kind of that stood out, um, and this, this, doesn't, this just seems to represent a larger demographic across the IT sector, um, for better or worse. But what jumped out at me is they didn't have any age information. That's the thing about Google I'd really like to know. I'd like to know the yep. ages. I'd like to know, do they have a bunch of old guys there? They got a bunch of young guys, gals? What is it? What do they got? Yep. Well, and because well, uh, I guess we kind of talked about that earlier with the FreeBSD Dev Summit stuff. It's that the average age of a FreeBSD developer is in their 30s, whereas the Linux developers in their 20s. Hmm. Hmm. I'd be curious to see what it looks like, to look like at the Goog. So anyways, Goog's got yes. that up on their blog, and we'll have a link to that in the Roundup show notes if you guys want to see that. Now, speaking of postmortems, how about a whole bunch of them, Alan? What do you think? Yes. 
Uh, so a website called Peak Scale has a, a pin board, which is a bookmarking service, and they have uh, a crap ton. They've collected a whole bunch Holy of them smokes. and put them all together, uh, which is quite handy. Yeah, uh, so one hundred and ninety-six. Yeah, one hundred and ninety-six. You can dig through a whole bunch of different postmortems. It's got stuff from like Amazon and Google and <laughs> lots of little places, and I think uh, there's just a, a big uh, bunch of them. And, uh, you know, it's definitely good reading if you're interested in this kind of stuff or just, you know, learning what not to do, right? Uh, they have the Zencoder, which is a company that does video encoding uh, for people. Uh, Bitly's one about they're uh, getting compromised, right? Uh, the Chef people, Chef is a, a framework kind of like um, Puppet for managing servers. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their enterprise hosted search API, and that went down. Google Cloud, GitHub. Uh, fast mail, DNS simple, uh, Pivotal Web Services API outage, Google, 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 Gentoo even. Uh, you know, box. How this guy got his uh, VPS hacked and what he did about it, you know. Heroku. Uh, even the people from Eve, the online game, have one. Canonical. Yeah. Uh, ah, even Digital Ocean has uh, their, uh, when they had a problem with their power system at their New York data center. You know, uh, it's kind of a thing that's uh, almost become like a badge of pride from internet companies is that we're not afraid to admit when we made a mistake and, and, uh, and kind also, of explain what we did. And isn't it a way for them to demonstrate how they can meticulously go through a process and show you that they have the facilities to manage these things? Yeah, when something unexpected happens, they are actually set up to deal with it. Yeah, that's why I uh, like them. That's that's what I like know, about. Sometimes them. you'll get, you know, some companies there'll be like a, you'll get a statement that looks like a postmortem called a, a reason for outage or RFO. Yeah. Uh, but oftentimes those are under like a confidentiality clause where only the customers are allowed to look at them. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of the companies, uh, like Joyet, will be like, we let everybody see this because everybody should learn from this, so that you know something good comes out of it. So it happens less. Yeah. That's the that's the real benefit. All right. Well, uh, we remember Netflix releasing details about ISP speeds. Well, guess who else just started doing this? YouTube started rating U.S. ISPs, uh, giving you now it does not available in my area for whatever reason, but it is available in some of your areas. It'll give you video streaming results, and they've also got a really high, uh, very high end, high production graphic explaining how internet bottlenecks work. Uh, Alan. Is this an indication that YouTube is next to sign a peering agreement with Comcast? Because remember how I no, I think YouTube is wanting to do the opposite, right? They're wanting to, they're doing free uh, settlement free peering, which means you don't pay, right? It's like, hey, ISP, we're YouTube, and um, you're getting a lot of traffic from us, and currently you're paying somebody to bring that traffic from us to you. Uh, you know, the ISP and YouTube are both paying for transit across the internet. Well, if we connect directly, neither of us would have to pay anything, right? It's a win-win situation, and so YouTube's pushing for that, and that's what Netflix does too. We're like, we're not even going to just directly peer with you; we'll give you the content, uh, or directly peer with you if if you're in one of the locations. But uh, it's the right way to do it. Um, but sadly, people like Comcast and Verizon see charging people, charging businesses like YouTube and Netflix for it as a business model to get free money for mm -hmm. nothing. Get money. For something they should be doing because their customers are already paying to get the content from YouTube. YouTube shouldn't have to pay to give it to them. All right, Al. Now we have a story that's going to tell us why we need to avoid a certain variety of encryption at all costs, right? Uh, not quite. Okay, uh, tell so me what's up. AES XTS is a, a mode of AES that's specifically designed to do full disk encryption. And it works very well for that. But People that don't know any better try to use it for stuff <laughs> other than full disk encryption. I gotcha. Okay. And when they do, bad things happen. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, because as it is, full disk encryption requires a bunch of trade offs because of the way, the fact that the encryption layer has to be transparent. Uh, it means that the um, that the encryption layer doesn't know about the files, so it doesn't know how they're laid out on the file system, and so it can't quite do things the same way you normally would. Right, uh, and this article gets in, explains it much better than I could, uh, <laughs> and it just talks about you know the fact that you know there are things called block ciphers that encrypt in blocks, uh, but those blocks are not the same size as the blocks on your hard drive, which are you know five, twelve, or 
the sector size, like 4K. Uh, and because those don't line up, you can't just do it that way. And the fact that you know a file might get written to two places, two different places on the hard drive, like spread out, because a file's big, it'll get broken up into chunks. And fragmentation means it might be over here and over here. Well, you can't chain those pieces together. Uh, and if you chain them with other nearby blocks, every time you update one, you have to update them all, or you know all these other complications. And so AES XES makes a bunch of trade-offs uh, that make it work well for your full disk encryption, but make it really bad for other stuff. And so you'd want to avoid using it when you don't want to, or when you shouldn't. And this article explains when you shouldn't. You know, Good to know it. stuff. Because regular software developers are not going to be writing their own full disk encryption system, so they should never use XCS. Hmm. Well, good article, Alan. Thank you for linking us to it. Yep. All right. So I, this one caught my attention. It didn't, it didn't impact me at all, but I might have impacted some of you over, I think it was the weekend. This was on Sunday. Uh, it appeared Apple forgot to renew one of their SSL certs for the uh, Apple App Store. And so users were getting an error message when they go into the Mac App Store saying the certificate for the server is invalid. And you might be connected yep. to a bogus or, server. Yeah, and um, automatic update tools would just fail automatically. Like they yeah. would just not, yeah. And they seem uh, to have it fixed pretty quick, but... Well, yes, it's a fairly easy thing to fix. Um, it's just, yeah, it happens all the time. And because it's something that only happens like once a year or two years or five years, it's not something people always think about. Uh, there's a great plugin for Nagios uh, that you can set up a monitor on all your sites with SSL and check the certificate. And, you know, when the certificate is like a month from expiring, it goes into the warning state. And if it gets to two weeks of expiring, it goes into the, yeah. the critical state yeah. and starts alerting you, saying, hey, you have two weeks to renew that certificate. Pay attention Otherwise, over here. Things. Pay attention. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, obviously, Apple didn't have that. <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, I bet now they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we, got, uh, we got a statement here from PHK. It says, you know what? HTTP 2.0 should be scrapped. Just get it out of here. Yep. Get it out of here, he says. What's going on, Alan? Uh, well, you know, so there was this working group put together to try to decide what they should do for HTTP 2.0. And uh, after a lot of discussion, they kind of decided they maybe were just going to take Speedy and repackage it as HTTP 2.0. The problem is Speedy, while it uh, tried to, doesn't actually address all the security problems. Uh, and so it's actually not a good solution to the problem. Mm. And so he's saying, no, we should start over and do something right. <laughs> Get it out of here. He didn't say that. He's not Stallman. Oh. <clears throat> uh, but, yeah, he kind of talks, he goes into detail about what's wrong with HTTP 2.0. Uh, and, you know, the fact that the standard was going to have, you know, stuff for lawful interception, mm -hmm. it just goes to show you that it was not going to be what we wanted. And, you know, we've been using HTTP 1.1 for how long now? And that's only barely an extension of HTTP 1.0. Uh and so, you know, when we change to two, it's going to be, you know, a long time before we can even start using it and an even longer time uh, before we see another upgrade for it, right? And so we want to make sure we get it right. Get it out of here. All right, Alan. Very nice. You're horrible. <laughs> I hate you. I, I, I know. I do a TV I've, show with you. I've tainted you. I'm sorry. Uh, well, why don't we uh, we'll cl we'll cleanse by talking about a nice vulnerability for eBay. Yeah. Uh, so separate from the fact that eBay got compromised a couple of weeks ago or whatever, uh, they, there's this uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability that uh, apparently eBay's been told about, although I don't know if it was through their bug bounty program or not. Uh, and uh, they haven't fixed it yet, and it could allow someone to actually, uh, by tricking you into viewing this page or whatever, uh, or going to a certain eBay URL, it would allow the attacker to do things as your account by using the JavaScript to like, you know, simulate you clicking on something and actually doing something on uh, as your account when you're logged into eBay. Uh, I don't, I've dealt with eBay. Uh, actually, it was for PayPal, but eBay and PayPal's bug bounty program is the same one. Uh, and they've usually been pretty good. You, know, to, is you have to send them the email in the right format with PGP encrypted, and then uh, they set you up an account on their secure messaging system. And you use that for your communications back and forth, and they follow up and answer questions and, and deal with stuff, as far as I've seen. Uh, so I don't know if it's just the guy wasn't clear on how to communicate it with eBay, or if eBay decided it wasn't a bug, or what. Maybe they're busy with the password reset stuff. Possibly. But yeah. uh, their cross-site scripting is high on the list on their bug bounty program, so I would have expected it to be taken care of. So maybe, maybe a, Yeah, you'd see. expect a more serious response. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had that moment where you pull out 
like an old rig, something you've had for years and years, and you go to use it, and it, like the machine boots up, but you don't remember the login. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the FreeBSD channel the other night, we were talking, or last night actually, uh, the subject turned over to uh, the new console system that FreeBSD is getting, and it boots in VGA mode and then upgrades to fancy graphics when you get X, right? Uh, and it, they were like, well, what? We, with EUFI and stuff, it was like, when, when's the resolution we could start at? And they get all this talk about VGA and how it works to happen. And then that made Peter went in his closet and dug out his old uh, dual <laughs> CPU Pentium 90 whoop, whoop. Uh, that was running FreeBSD. So I think uh, back in the day, that would have been like a 2. something, but it, it had been upgraded to 4.6 at the time, uh, which would be, I don't know, 2003, 2004, maybe, 2005, something like that, which is pretty new for a Pentium 90. But... Um, I had like 32 megabytes of RAM and stuff. Uh, but when he booted it up and went to log in, he was like, oh, what was my password 20 years ago? Yeah, that's a little and, hard to remember. And so immediately someone turned it into an image macro. Yeah, I love it. You got you to get your memes in while you can. Uh, exactly. That's from a South Park. And it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> that's and a good South Park. Gone. Yeah, and it's gone. <laughs> There you go. All right, Alan. Well, here's a here's a hot tip. Don't feel like upgrading XP? Don't need to. Just change your registry and get those updates. Nothing will go wrong. Okay. Uh, so there's a embedded version of Windows XP called uh, POS Ready or something like that. What's it called? <laughs> it's, a, it's for the point-of-sale systems. Yeah, like we've yeah. talked about a lot of point-of-sale systems. Like the XP embedded XP. systems and whatnot. And so Microsoft's still supporting those. Some vendor paid them, and they're making Windows updates for it. Uh-huh. Uh, so if you change a certain register key to make your machine look like it's one of those, all of a sudden, Windows updates will appear in your Windows update uh, system. Uh, however, Microsoft comments that those updates are not tested for regular desktop Windows XP, only for the <laughs> embedded version. And uh, they don't fix all the bugs, only the ones they feel would actually affect the point-of-sale systems which generally maybe are not even connected to the internet. So I doubt there's Internet Explorer updates going out to the embedded systems. Uh, and so, you know, it's not something you should rely on. Uh, but, and, and it's entirely possible those updates could break your system and make it unbootable. Totally call but, this, though. I knew this was coming. I knew it. Well, I forgot that, that their POS thing would be there. I, I didn't think it would be so trivial. It's literally just adding a one in a how registry. How many times have like but how many thing how many times have we seen like things in in Windows that differentiate the product by simple hacks like that too? It's so well, funny. Yeah. yeah. It's just a history of that kind of stuff. And like I said, you know, if they're making the patches for somebody, that means the code's out there. Yep. But this registry uh, but hack if they're only doing it for the things that person needs and it doesn't cover everything you need, then you feel like, oh, I, I did this right. hack. I'm getting all my Windows I'm, updates. Well, I would, I would, I think more likely people feel like they got a self sense of, well, I'm sure the really important stuff I'm still getting a patch for, and you have no idea if that's the case and or not. Possibly some of it and some of it not yeah. exactly. But so what to me was interesting still is still should move, but you can try. You make that change, and then boom, you're just back to using Windows Update. Like you don't have to like have a special like log into a TechNet account or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's just make this change. Bob's your uncle. Very good, Alan. Was well, there anything else we want to cover this week? Uh, no. No, okay. Well, I'll just leave you guys with a little bit of essentials. We'd love to hear from you. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and then choose TechSnap from the drop down and send us your questions. We just went through a whole bunch of them today, so we need some more. So go over there. Send it to TechSnap or start a thread in our subreddit, links.techsnap.tv. That's also where you can submit stories, vote things up or down, or leave comments or just engage with the community for folks who are trying to build solutions or solve problems, links.techsnap.tv. Don't forget that new BSD Now episode's out. And join me on Monday for Tech Talk Today, a brand new daily show in which I will slowly be committing suicide. I suspect. (laughs) <laughs> and also, we can, we'd can we love to have you watch us live. Go over to jblive.tv at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is? 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Boom. Over at jblive.tv or jblive.info for the audio version. And last but not least, go grab yourself a TechSnap RSS feed. That way you get the systems network and administration goodness every single week when it's released. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week.